I think that's my own. Yep. And we'll, we're going to be watching it. We're going to put it up on the monitor in, uh, oh. in our room. And uh, awesome. Sure Let me go manage some kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good luck. Awesome. And actually, they don't. Hey, good morning. It, it rolls into kind of place without it. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we go out in the hallway and check the audio so we don't get fever and we'll be good to go. Cool. Everybody note that we are live streaming, so uh -huh. anything you say can and will be used against you. <laughs> Y'all got it? You want to set it on the table right up front?
waste nearly an hour if this task is completed once a year, every day for the year. Since the post-war housing boom in the 50s, this problem has plagued about 427 million Americans, and it still does today. A few of our justification statistics were that it takes about nine seconds to get to the door from the other side of the room and get back. Um, and this would add up to almost an hour each year just on closing the door. On average, people work or walk through about 10 interior doors every day. And the interruption can cause you to defocus for up to 25 minutes. And this problem um, affects about 42 million teenagers and 125 million desk workers in America. So we looked at a few existing solutions before creating our own to see what was on the market and what we could do differently to create our product to solve a new problem. This is the first existing solution that really related to ours that we wanted to incorporate into our design. It is an Embrighton smart door sensor. It connects to Google Homes and Alexas and it can tell people when the door is open or closed it doesn't quite have the technology to open and close the door, but the fact that it can sense open or close was definitely a factor we wanted to somehow incorporate into our design. Our second one, it did the job. It can close a door, um, but it is definitely overpowered. It weighs over 17 pounds, and it is over $500. And it's mainly meant for industrial commercial use, and so people in businesses and office buildings and exterior doors mainly, it can close. But I wouldn't see anyone putting this on a bedroom or office door. Our third solution was meant for gates. This one, the technology we wanted to incorporate into our design, because it was basically what we wanted to do. It takes a gate and it has a remote control, and you can press the button to close and open the gate. But it's a gate, not a door. So we had to alter the design a little bit in order to create it one that would close interior doors, which is what we were facing. Some of the STEM principles we faced were um, the tour gap placement. We did some calculations and found out that um, if the door requires a lower torque to close it, the time needed to close the door will decrease. So we had to find the spot on the door that would have the lowest torque that would be the optimal place to place our design. Our second concept was the noise decibel. We did not want our door to slam shut. We would want it to close gently, and we found that we wanted to try to keep the door closing at about 60 decimals or less. Our third stem concept was the velocity to close the door. We wanted the door to close with a fast enough velocity so that it would close the door on time and our time standard was at six seconds or under. So we talked to our expert, and this is some of the feedback he told us to consider. He said that we should consider 3D printing some of our parts. Um, he also asked about the shape of the rod for more contact and the placement of the rod, and about the torque, if we should or where we should place the door closer so that we optimize that in relation to the torque, um, how far the point of contact should be from the hinges, and the kind of materials that we should use. So we looked at plastic and metal and the material properties in order to find the most optimal material. So these were the parameters that we wanted to set up to make sure our device covered all the bases that we wanted it to. First, we wanted it to have a fail-safe. So if there's something in the doorway or something obstructing it from closing, we wanted it to be able to stop and recognize that because it, that is a safety concern and we wanted to make sure that our product does not harm anything. We also wanted it to fit the legal standards. There's a lot of standards on door closers about fire safety because exiting and entering buildings. So we needed to make sure that it didn't hold the door closed in any way or prevent people from getting out in an emergency. We want it to be remote controllable because, again, our problem was that we needed to get up to close the door. So if it's remote controllable, that's not needed and we can do it from a distance. We want it to meet the required time because no one wants to wait three minutes for a door to close. And so we wanted it to close in a timely manner to make it accessible for users. 
And we were given a budget of $50 by our STEM department, and we wanted to make sure we stayed in this budget and made it manageable for our prototype. We also wanted it to be flexible and be able to fit different kinds of doors and have minimal maintenance because we don't want this to be something that intrudes on someone's life. It's supposed to help it. And so we wanted it to just be forgotten about almost. We don't want this to be a big thing that people think about. It's something to help their life, which is why we want it to blend into the environment. We want it to be small, fit size requirements, five inches by seven inches by four. And we want it to appeal to our target market, which is teenagers and desk workers. And we want it to be eco-friendly, meaning that we want to include a slip of paper that tells how to dispose of all the different parts in a safe manner, because we don't want to harm the environment with our device. And we want it to be non-permanent and easy to install for anyone who's renting or just trying to try our product and encourage people to get it. So here, based on those, based on those uh, specifications, here are the two final brainstorms we came up with. There were a bunch to start, but then we did a design, uh, decision matrix to decide on two final ones to narrow it down and come up with a solution. The one you see on our left is actually what we went with. It is a servo motor connecting to a rod that hits the door and closes it, as you see in front of you as well. And the other one, there, it was a piece of tape or something that connects to a door, and that connects to a string connected to a spindle in a device, which turns as the door closes and eventually pulls it all the way shut. We didn't go with this one because of the fragility of a cord and it was just infeasible based on the materials we had. So for our CAD drawing, as she said, we decided to model that brainstorm on the left. We used a program called Onshape to model our design. Uh, as you can see, we have a blue servo motor, um, which is over here. This is kind of the servo motor part. And then we had the brown metal rod that we modeled to, like kind of when it's spun, um, that would close the door shut. So our budget is a little, the VEX parts themselves cost over $500, which are all incorporated towards the design. However, for us to create this prototype, it did not cost anything because we were able to use these products and we'll reuse these products from the engineering department. And so the actual price is zero, but the cost to buy, build a new one yourself would be a little more. <laughs> and so here's some of our construction photos. We started by constructing a model door by which to do our tests on. And then we took a couple metal plates and put them together in order to form a base to connect everything else to. And then we put the servo motor on the left and two gears under it to create a mechanically advantageous gear ratio um, to make our product more, to give it more power. And then we connected the rod underneath to hit the door on the side. And then we connected this to the to the mount on top of our model door. It's not quite a real door, but it did the job. And then we connected a cortex, a VEX cortex, and the battery pack. And here's a button that's no longer in use. And so now we're going to demonstrate the use of our product. So to activate um, the door closing device, we have a remote. Um, we press one of the buttons, and it closes the door. And then when you release the button, um, the rod should go back to its resting position. This also acts as our fail safe. Um, basically, when you just stop pressing the button, it will go back. So like if someone's in the doorway and you let go of the button, the door won't actually shut. Our first test for our prototype was the closing speed test. We attached our device to the door and um, closed the door and timed how many seconds it took to close the door completely. And then we recorded this time and adjusted the device if it did not meet our standards. Our second test was the remote control test. Um, so we set up the device and the remote control and programmed them to be in sync. 
and we lie or we lay down a um, tape measure that went up to like 70 feet and we tested if the remote control passed or failed at every five feet mark until it failed. Our third test was the durability test. We basically um, performed 10 trials and then if any adjustments needed to be made or if any error was accumulated, we recorded it and um, made the necessary adjustment. And we did that for up to 50 trials total. So for our first test, um, you can see the results here. Our second, um, were between about one and three, and they averaged to be about 1.77 seconds total. This was a lot um, less than our standard time or our criteria of six seconds, so no adjustments were needed to be made. For our second test, um, the remote control test, as you can see, it passed the 55 feet mark, but it failed at the 60 feet mark. So, our, um, I think, maximum distance was about 57 feet, and this definitely exceeded our expectation of our average standard bedroom, which was about 15 feet in an American home. For our third test, we had no errors recorded in the first 30 trials, but at the 40 trial mark, we noticed that when the rod was going back to the resting position, it would swing a little bit past the resting position and then come back to the resting position. Um, we noticed that this was an issue because if there was to be a wall, it could possibly damage the wall. So what we did to fix that was we just tightened the closing, um, the space between the closing rod and the metal standoff. So this was the analysis that I basically just went over. Um, I would also like to mention that, that here, um, this problem that we noticed was not like something that just came up after 40 trials. It was there since the beginning, but we just decided or noted or thought that at the beginning that it wouldn't be um, anything major. It wasn't until like the 40th trial that we decided to fix it. So there are a couple people we'd like to thank for their help in today's presentation. We would like, like to thank first our mentor, Mr. Pete Ramanata. He is an engineer who has met with us several times over the course of the last year and helped us just narrow down our design and give us a real world professional perspective on our issue and different things that he would consider in his engineering design process. We'd also thank Mr. Walker for building us a model door and for teaching us and giving us the skills to create this presentation. And so there are a few things that, if we did again, we would probably improve. First, we create a box to make it more aesthetically pleasing, because the prototype itself, we didn't fully enclose it. And so if we were creating a real-world product, we would create a box so that people wouldn't notice it as much in their homes. We'd also make a more powerful motor, because our model door is great, but a real door would, create, would require more power to close. And so we need a bigger motor with more power and more, probably, uh, different batteries too, to actually operate the device on a normal basis. Also, we do real door testing to make sure things like the latch closed and just little things that we wouldn't expect to go wrong with a real door that we could test on a real door. And we'd also, we didn't really meet our eco-friendly expectation because we did not have a paper that told how to dispose of all these. Although these all are all reused on a normal basis in the STEM department. So our disposal is eco-friendly, but we do not tell people that because it's a prototype. We would now like to ask the audience if they have any questions or comments. So I have a question. Um, you touched on this slightly there again, but that, that's the only door that you tested on, right? Like you don't know how heavy is a door to be able to close with that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, looking back, to, you made the adjustment after the 40th try, but you saw that uh, there was a, this would be a potential 
looking back, if you were to do it again, like, right, initially, I know now in hindsight, if you were to do another project, would you realize uh, I should attack these problems immediately and not be a problem? Or did you realize this wasn't what this? Uh, as I'm asking my question, I realized that you, how did you, how did you look at that problem differently as you, as you got to the full year time? What made you say, all right, let, let's change the stuff, let's do it, let me know what you're doing. Um, so, at the beginning, we just didn't really think that it would, like, have to touch the wall because it was, like, barely past the 90 degree mark, I guess. So, we thought, like, it wasn't a problem initially, but then, I guess we kind of changed our minds. Um, I'm not sure what just kind of changed it. We just, like, collaborated, I guess, and decided that it was an issue. Um, and yes, if we were to do it again, we'd probably notice that earlier and try to fix things as soon as we saw them. Uh, first off, great job. Uh, my question is about the uh, focusing, and uh, you brought that up. I think that was a really important part of this is, you know, the teenagers looking at their phone and stuff like that, and the amount of time it takes to refocus the so, came up with a time of 25 minutes, I believe, to refocus. How did you come up with that data? Uh, we looked at a few studies online, and one was peer-reviewed, and we had actually read it, we heard about it from one of our teachers last year, I believe, and it was Miss Brasto. Miss Brasto told us, she made, our pros, made us put our phones up every day, because she said any time we look at our phone, it takes 25 minutes to refocus. And so the same would go for going, and we think she's a pretty reliable source. Um, so any time we would have to go up, get up and go close the door, it's going to take our what we've engraved in our head as 25 minutes to refocus. In your model, if, uh, if the arm had stayed shut, I guess the door could still open, but does that damage the servo if the arm is shut and you could push the door open? Yeah, because it would, it could just hurt the motor, motor itself. You know? I like aesthetically, I don't know if I love that hanging out in the hallway, but, you know, practically, it was going to strip the servo and push it over. Yeah, this, so the idea would be that this would be like against a wall, um, so it wouldn't be like sticking out really, it would be closed up against the surface of the wall. You make it. 180 degrees That's something we could definitely think about if we, that's probably something we'd look at if we had more time to complete this project. And it's probably an improvement we could make and we could have an adjustment for whether you want it to stay at 180 or 90. Because if it is up against a wall on two sides and you can't have it at 180, so it would make it difficult for some users. But that's definitely something we could look at. That's just kind of programming of rotations of the gear. All right, thank you, girls. Let's give it up. Okay. We would like to thank you all for uh, your time. All right, Ben, Calvin, come on and start setting up. Make sure your presentation is emailed to me. Jeff, what do we have to do now? I have uh, more forms in this pen, so you can just make a stack of completed forms here. Yeah, I did ask him to tally the numbers, so I don't have to tell you. Scrap on that shot. Yeah, I have to
Josh, do you want to judge? You got uh, years of engineering. That's really hard for me. I'm kidding. Sit back and relax. <laughs> He's going to judge. That's a little over. He's already judged it. So you can ignore the text I just sent. Just in case you want to score your son and your dad as you watch. <laughs> or you don't have to look at it at all. Are y'all ready? So the so marginal is the worst score I can get. <laughs> Thank you. 
Test, test, test. Hello. Hi, my name is Calvin, and I'm Ben Lesson, and today we'll be showing you our senior capstone project, which we made a soccer goal moving device. So unless you've moved a soccer goal, you don't fully understand the weight and size a goal has, and this makes it extremely difficult to move and dangerous. Now, through this presentation, we plan on hitting many of these points, um, explaining how we went through our planning, our testing, and our building of this device. And we decided to choose this project because both of us have played soccer for many years. And through these years of experience, we have found that it's a real annoyance to move soccer goals. This process often takes around four or more people to safely move the goal, along with making it easier to move the goal. So full-size soccer goals can range anywhere between 200 to 500 pounds, according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and are about 24 feet in length. So this makes them very big and awkward to move, which makes them dangerous to move. In a 30-year study, the CPSC found that 1,800 kids were sent to the emergency room due to injuries caused by movable soccer goals. So we had to further justify this problem by finding articles and other sorts of data to prove that this was a problem. So in the risk management report, by RPS Bowling or Sports and Leisure, they really addressed this issue. They said that there are about 500,000 soccer goals, which show that it is a wide problem. It can be an issue. Um, they go over the different ways that goals can hurt people, including goals tipping over when hanging on the crossbar, people running into the goals, and another one is goals falling onto people when they're being moved from location to location. They have different solutions for this that they lay out, but one of the biggest ones is allowing only trained people to move the goals and allowing for adequate manpower to move the goals. Now, another article that we found by the Consumer Product Safety Commission stated that in testing in 1994, about 16 million people were playing soccer that year. And of these 16 million people, there was a reported 200 that were injured by soccer goals, and that number is often more because not everyone reports an injury. And of these 200 people, there is at least one person who has died by a soccer goal that year. So to further justify our problem, we asked, sent a survey out to our peers, and we just wanted to see if this was an issue for them. So when we got 60 responses, 41 of them responded and said that they at some point had moved to soccer goal. So this data shows their responses to some of the 41 people's responses to some of these questions. This first one, on average, how many people did it take to move the soccer goal? You can see through the graph, took about, took, most people took, on average, four people to move the soccer goal. So this shows that it is a big hassle and you need plenty of people to move the goal. In another survey question, we asked how did they move the goal? 85% of people said at some point they had moved it by picking up the goal. This would take three or more people to move the goal. Um, and only 34% of people said that they had used wheels or dolly to help move the goal. So these existing solutions. So. Now, there are a few solutions to this problem, um, like the one above. But many of these solutions require you to permanently install a device on the goal. And this is often a hassle. If the device breaks, it makes it harder to move the goal. Along with being permanently installed, they're often very expensive, um, which we aimed as one of our problems to fix with making it able to be removed along with a much cheaper device. So another existing solution is the safe soccer goals. Um, 
these are rollers that are attached onto the back of the goal that double as a goal weight. So if the user wants, they can pick up the goal from the front two posts. Two people pick it up and they can roll the goal across. Again, this is a very expensive solution. These don't, uh, these are permanently attached, so they're very difficult to get off. So if you want to move a different goal that doesn't have it on, you can't do that. Now, these are the materials that we tried to focus on through this project and would have liked to use stainless steel as it is very strong and good in many weather conditions. Um, but due to budget, we decided to go with wood, which is strong enough to support the weight of the goal. It is very cheap and easy to work with. So throughout this project, we had to contact experts and people that knew the field of engineering and also soccer goals. Um, one of the first experts that helped us was John Maloney. He went at very early on, he introduced us to a lot of engineering principles that we need to apply with our product, including margin of error. So if we were testing on a 300 pound soccer goal, we'd still need to be able to withstand the weight of up to 700 pounds. So making it so safe for everyone, giving that room for error. Another help was Scott Flowers, who is the director of soccer operations at Charlotte Independence. We asked him many questions about how people move the goals at his club, and he explained that most people just pick up the goal or they use gators to move the goal. He said that the wheels that they have on some goals are generally rust or break, which makes it even harder to move the goal, so they prefer to use goals that don't have any existing solutions on. Another big help was early on was Jared Lesson. We were doing a lot of physics work and neither of us were physics experts, so he helped introduce us to some of these different forces that would be applied to our product and goal onto that. Now, through this product we, project, we were able to find some design specifications and on the board are our top six. And of these six, we decided that ergonomics, performance, and safety and legal would be the top ones that we would focus on. We wanted to make sure that our product would meet the guidelines by the CPSC, or Consumer Product Safety Commission, while also being able to use no more than two people, but optimally, we would like to use one person to move the goal, along with it being easy enough to use and safe to use. Yeah. And like we said, at our original specification, we said that we wanted it to take a maximum amount of two people. A lot of the prior solutions used two people, but ideally we wanted to make it so the product could be used by only one person. And these were our top two brainstorms that we had come up with during our decision matrix um, and decided to end up using the decision on the right. And this product would have failed, but we decided to mock it up and make some changes to it. Yeah, after this, we did some testing and they failed, we decided to go back to the design process and we created a lever arm design. This design is the one that we eventually went with. Um, this would allow the user to push a lever up, which would push the wheel down and at the same time move the goal up. So. Here we can see a mock-up, which we used to show to Mr. Walker, our mentor, that this idea would work and could work on a larger scale. So here are our 3D CAD model pictures. Um, as you can see, we have the lever arm right here, which is used to push the wheel down and wheel on the bottom of it, and also a U-bolt to lock, on, lock the product onto the goal to keep the goal from rotating. And through this project, we had a $50 budget and ended up only spending about $56 um, due to already having prior products or sorry, materials as the plywood and the wood post, which cover costs significantly. And I would like to really focus in on this heavy duty caster wheel. Um, that we decided to fix to the wood post since it was solid rubber and with the 8 inch diameter allowed us to get more clearance underneath the goal to create more room in the back of the goal to move the product easier at a more comfortable height for the average human being. Along with these U-bolts that allowed us to attach it to the goal that were strong enough to support the weight of the goal and keep the device without it breaking.
So once we had all the materials and a plan to attack this, we started the construction. So the first step, we took a three by three quarter inch uh, wood board and we drilled four holes into it. That would be the diameter holes of the U-bolts. So this board would be used to attach the U-bolts to the goal and lock the goal in place, lock the product in place. Next, we drilled in half inch holes into both the first board and the wood block. These holes would be used for the pivot point of the product and attach the, bolt, the product together. Next, we, uh, we drilled in the, the wheel platform into the wood post to uh, secure it on good. And then once that was on, we took a big bolt that was used for the pivot point. And we tightened that on to keep both components of the product together. And once those two were assembled, we had this product. And all that was needed was a, a hole drilled onto the top of the wood uh, block that would put that the lever arm would go into. So for assembling this product onto the goal, um, here you can see we have all the necessary materials that we listed above, including two socket wrenches that were used to tighten things together. Um, so first step is getting, putting the vertical board about eight to 12 inches behind the goal post. This would allow for allow once the wheel is activated for enough clearance so that the user could move the goal from the back at a comfortable angle while also keeping, um, while also leaving enough space so that the product isn't too heavy for the user to move. Um, once that's done, put the rubber sleeve on, which would help increase the amount of compression on the locking system. And once that was on, put we tightened and put on U-bolts that would secure the goal product go onto the product. The next step was we put the wheel onto the wood board and we put the pivot point bolt in. Once that was in we tightened it with socket wrenches on the other side and then the last step was just to put the barbell into the top of it as the lever arm and it was ready to go. Here's a demonstration of our product once it's onto the goal. So first you can see that Calvin moves the lever arm up, puts a locking pin in. This locking pin would keep the goal from, keep the lever arm and wheel in place, so to keep it safe and activated. Then he goes to the other side and does the same thing on the other side. Once both sides are, once both sides are up, he just goes to the back of the goal, picks it up, and pushes. You can see in the video it's a little bit uneven. It's because we didn't properly measure the distance for each of the wood plates, but it still worked great. Once he's done, all he needs to do is set it down and take out the safety pins on each side and put the lever arm down. So you can see through this video that the product worked great. It also was on a 540 pound soccer goal, which is heavier than what we originally planned to move and higher than the weight that the Consumer Product Safety Commission recommends for soccer goals. So then once that side's done, he just goes to the other side, does the same thing. Now through this process, we were going through for testing protocols, and for our test protocol, first testing protocol, we did an ergonomics test, where we timed a few people putting on the device the goal, and taking about an average of 6.16 minutes. Um, and then next we had our second test protocol. So this test protocol we wanted to measure the amount of force that it took for each of the three key movements of using and applying our product to the goal. So the first key movement was the lever arm force. So we used a force plate, we used a force plate, tied it on to the, with the rubber band, and then we did the motion of pushing the lever arm up with the force plate. And the reading said that it got the maximum weight for both the tests was 43 pounds of force. So this may, our test requirements said that it needed to be below 50 pounds. So we passed this test and a normal person would be able to do this, move this product. The second motion was the lifting test. So you can see we put the force plate in the back. This would be measure the amount of force it took to lift up the goal once the wheels were deployed. 
once it was strapped in, we tested the amount of force it took. It took about 90 pounds each time, which 90 pounds of force each time, which we found the average user would be able to move. The third part was the pushing. So once the wheels are activated, once the, the goal is picked up, we measured the amount of force it took to push the goal. So that got to about 85 pounds of force, which we found was also below the test requirements. So overall, this product would be able to be used by the average person and um, safe, safely and easily used. Next we had our rotation test, which we used to determine the amount of rotation that would be activated by the device when it was activated. So when we were going through our product uh, with our first prototype, we found that there was rotation when the product is activated. This would happen whenever the weight of the goal would force the product to cave in on itself. And at first we used just a plain U-bolt and when the product was activated we got about two seconds for each side of the goal before it collapsed on itself. Next we tried a rubber sleeve with some rubber stoppers and again it wasn't very long for our first um, side of the goal, but when the right side kept staying up, we figured that the left side was supporting the weight of the goal, giving it more time to stand up. So next we decided to use the Eagle and just rubber sleeve and found that the product was able to stand up by itself and decided that we would try and move the product and was able to move it another 30 yards instead of standing in place um, for a total of 52.3 seconds. And the modifications that we had through this product was just really adding a either a rubber sleeve or the rubber stoppers. Um, so our first trials were without the rubber stoppers and the sleeve. And then second, we tried with both and realized that was too much. So we went back to just a simple rubber sleeve. Other modif smaller modifications we made included cutting these U-bolts down right here, as if you tighten it too much with the different rubber pieces it would interfere with the wheel, um, and that's about all the modifications we made. So, summary of our product, our product um, we do feel like we solved the problem that we originally set out to solve. Um, we, we made a product that passed all of our design specifications, including exceeding the expectation of making it so two people could move the goal. Only one person was needed to activate and move the goal, so we passed on that. So what makes our product unique is it's much cheaper than other solutions. Um, it was easy to use, we think, once onto the goal. It requires only one person, which almost every other existing solution doesn't have. It, most existing solutions take two people. So this is very unique in that way. And it's also not permanently attached to the goal. A lot of these existing solutions either come with the goal or they have to be drilled into the goal permanently. And through this progress, projects, we learn to apply the design process um, by using our testing, our building, and mostly starting with our planning of the project, figuring out what to use for data, what to, what we need to really look for. Next, we figured out um, the calculations that we needed to use, whether it be for gravity, whether it be for friction, many other factors. And we also learned how to write professional emails and communicate with our mentors um, and using the information provided by mentors and other experts to help us with our data and our project. And there's different, many different directions we could go to improve and improve and make our product even better. One of the key parts was the efficiency of the installation. As you saw earlier, it took about six minutes to put onto the goal, which was a lot longer than we hope that it could because it might be a little difficult to put onto the goal. So finding a different way to lock it onto the goal, different little locking system or attachment to make it easier for the user would be better. Also quality of materials would be an issue that we could address. We were using wood which could rot, not withstand weather and easily crack. So using something like stainless steel or something along those lines that could withstand weather and look nicer. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for their support. 
our mentor John Maloney, he was so much help throughout the entire project. He, when we hit rough spots, he'd always be there encouraging us, always great, always had great ideas, and also not only went over our project, but also taught us a lot about engineering throughout and kept us excited about engineering. Um, I'd like to thank my dad, Jerry Lesson, on this year where we were mostly online for the year. It was really nice to just have an engineer in the house that I could walk over to, ask a quick question about, and he'd have a nice response. Also, it was a great help with our building our project. I'd like to thank Mr. Walker. We had a lot of fun with this class, and having a great year building and designing one of our an idea for the entire year, which is great. I'd also like to thank our product testers, uh, Spencer Kay and Brian Borst, who were there and took time out of their day to help test our products. And now we would like to take any questions from the judges. So the device would not be on the goal like while the game is being played, right? It's just you're attached to move it and take it off? Well, the, the, sorry. Um, the goal would actually be in front of the product, so the product would be behind the post, so it could stay on, but we just want it designed so that maybe you could put it on, move a goal, um, once the goal's moved, you can either take it off or play, but then move the goal back. Do you think the Consumer Product Safety Commission would be concerned about it being on the goal like during gameplay from like a safety perspective? Um, yeah, it, likely because it doesn't have smooth edges and it would be kind of close to the field of play. They might have issues with that. But There are also current products that are permanently installed that are also a lot that look similar to ours. So that would also, I'm sure it would have to be a question that we'd have to talk with the Consumer Product Safety Commission about. Do you envision any problem? Do you, do you test it? It looks like you're most hard on turf. Do you picture any problems on a natural grass field or anything along those lines? Um, well, really depends on the field as grass fields can vary if it's just dirt or if it's very nice grass fields. Um, it really depends. I think the product would stand up well on grass fields, but we would really need to test with the actual motion of moving the device, um, moving the goal, as there would be a lot more bumps than there would be in turf. Yeah. Also, on maybe a very wet field or muddy field, it might be difficult because um, the product is only on two wheels. Most other products have four wheels, so all the weights in the two wheels and might dig into the ground and make it harder to move an increased amount of force the user needs to move the goal. You mentioned the, the design, like the first design, and then you said it was, like, it was a failure you didn't build that one. I just got kind of thrown off there. What was that? Um, so we, we made two designs. Uh, well, we brainstormed a lot of designs, and we decided on two different ones. Oh, OK. It was just in the brainstorming. Yes. yes. Okay. So then when we did more calculations and talk, thought it through even more, we realized that they wouldn't be able to work the ways as efficiently or as effectively as we wanted them to. And did you pitch this to Coach Edenhoff? How much did you sell it? Probably free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's For his investment in your life, free. Yes. <laughs> yes. If, if you were marketing it, what do you, like, you kind of had two problems. One, that there's injuries when people move, and the other, that it's just annoying and not get so many people to move it. What do you think the biggest sales point would be, the injury factor or the annoyance factor? Well, the annoyance kind of builds off of the, uh, or the annoyance kind of leads to injuries. So having, making, it's a very difficult goal to move. It's very big, awkward to carry. So that it happens to lead to some of the injuries. So I mean, if we make it easier for a user to move the goal, then it also might cut down the injuries. But I feel like using the injuries to justify that it was a problem was good, and then making it easier to use would allow for consumers to enjoy the product. All right, good job. Awesome. Thank you all for your time, and we hope you have a good day.
Yeah, I apologize. The prepare person would have totaled those up. So. <laughs> <laughs> you need to write it. Cool. All right, thanks for coming. Yeah, it was great. I'll turn my last lesson. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go with my mind. I'm going to go with my still out. We'll see how this thing is. <laughs> we'll see what the judges think. <laughs> oh, here, I can take that rubric back. You don't have to take the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Tough, tough so year being remote. You are. Yeah. Woo! Tough at it. Yeah. 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 We're hoping all of the judges will yeah. take that in consideration. We were virtual yeah. until uh, April. I think it was when we were in March. They do. They've got really good products, but they spent a lot of time after school. Nice work, gentlemen. All right, let me go wrangle my next group. So I have more rubrics. I'll take y'all out in a second after I. I've been at Pine Lake since kindergarten, and I've been in STEM since eighth grade, and I'm super excited to be attending the University of South Carolina in the fall. So here's just the objectives that we're going to go through for our project, starting with 
um, how we found our concept, all the way down to the testing and summary. Have you ever had the problem of water running down your arms when you're washing your face at the bathroom sink? Well, this was a major problem for not only me and Jane, but our family and friends that we talked to. And when we were brainstorming problems to find solutions to, this was the major problem that we thought could relate to most people and a major problem that we thought most people have in their day-to-day -day life. Okay, so based on the 20 million users of major cosmetic companies, we found that um, when you wash your face over the bathroom sink, there was an annoyance that was created. And um, based on um, surveys that we did and information that we found from cosmetic companies, there was annoyance created when you wash your face in the bathroom sink. And as you can see from the um, pie chart, um, over half the time when you wash your face, water drips down your arms, either each time or every other time. So here right here are some existing solutions we had to research before starting to figure out what our final product would look like. First here on the left is on the cuff. It's a little bit on the cheaper end. Um, we have found that it's one size fits all, so we were trying to figure out whether we needed one size fits all or multiple sizes later on in the process. And this one's easy to use, but it only has a limited amount of absorbance, so when you wash your face and the water drips down your arms, the water will collect in the foam or whatever that's made out of, but it reaches a carrying capacity, so if the water reaches that capacity, it's going to start to trickle down your arms, so it can only hold so much amount of water which is why when looking for our new product, we needed to find something that would not have a carrying capacity. And then the drip knots were a little bit more expensive, about $30 for three pieces of cotton fabric, which we thought was a little outrageous. Um, and this is one size, and it is like a com more comfortable fabric, and it does absorb a lot of the water. So we wanted to find a happy medium in between these two products that our consumer would want to spend a medium amount of money on. Okay, so here are just the seven topics, the laws, rules, and regulations. So we wanted a material that wasn't going to take a long time to activate and deactivate. So we were looking into like a hydrophobic material, which is that um, led us to doing neoprene, which doesn't absorb the water. But we also looked into um, a regulation by the FDA of the biocompatibility of certain devices in contact with intact skin. So we wanted to make sure that the materials that we were using wouldn't cause any harm to the users, even if they were to decompose. Um, so we wanted to um, talk about our contributors and how they helped us make improvements. Mr. Walker and Mr. and Mrs. Halter had a huge impact on helping us um, get to our final solution. Like Mr. Walker gave us the great idea of using the neoprene rings, as you can see right there, for um, making it so that it fits a wide variety of sizes. And then um, Mr. and Mrs. Halter also helped us give ideas for collecting data and different, um, making sure that we get the correct values to um, have the right range of sizes for our product. And then um, they also, uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. and Mrs. Halter also helped us with um, just like finalizing our design and getting it to where it is today with like going from something like this all the way down to like this one and then we kept like making adjustments with the materials and even had the idea of having a wrap around but um yep so we had about 20 design specifications that we had to meet to fit our consumer needs for our end product the first one, I just put the four most important specifications that we had to meet, and these are the ones that we ended up testing. The product had to have an activation time of less than two minutes, which means the consumer needs to be able to put it on their hand and be ready for use in under two minutes. And it needed to stop at least 95% of the water that drips on your arms when you're washing your face. And we'll show you guys later how we test that in the presentation. And then it also needed to have a lifespan of three years. And the way we tested that is if you wash your face once a day for three years, it's about 1,095 times. So we had to put the cones on our hands and off our hands 1,095 times to test the lifespan. And it also needed to be able to operate at a low of 50 degrees Fahrenheit and at a high of 130 degrees Fahrenheit because you're not going to be leaving this product in your freezer. You might leave it in your car, which is why we had the high temperature, but it should be able to withstand those water temperatures. 
And we had lots of brainstorming ideas, but here are a few of our just different brainstorms that we came up with. The first one was a little bit of more of a glove idea. It was supposed to be a rubber glove with a little bit of a cotton wristband. And the idea was that the water would run down the rubber glove and be absorbed into the cotton. And then here's another idea we had. This was a bowl sprayer. Um, we were going to have like a bowl that sits in the sink and it's gonna have a tube that runs down the end of the bowl. And so as the bowl sprays your face with water, the tube would redirect the water back into the sink. So this would be a completely hands-off experience. And that was the bowl sprayer. And then this is what inspired our final design. Um, this is, we changed the dimensions, we made lots of adjustments to this brainstorm, but this is what our final design brainstorm looks like. Okay, so this is the CAD for the larger design. So originally we were just going to have one size, which was going to be a larger size, and we would have it fit just a wide variety of sizes, but then we realized that maybe we needed another size cone, so on the next slide it shows um, the CAD of a smaller size. But um, as we were developing the CAD, we realized that when uh, we wanted to attach the neoprene, we wanted to make sure that there was enough surface area to um, allow the glue to stick to. So Mr. Rocker gave us the great idea of actually widening um, the smaller side. And this is the picture of the smaller cone. As you can see, it has um, a smaller opening. And so Pine Lake gave us $50 to spend on this project and we had to figure out how to be under the budget. And so for our plastic cone, this is just like kind of a spreadsheet of what we spent. For the plastic cone, we used PLA plastic from the 3D printer in the school. And by calculating the length of the plastic we used, it would run us about $1.28 to mass produce the small cone and $1.58 to produce the large cone with the 3D printer. And for the neoprene, we ordered this ring, the neoprene ring, off of a company called Little Sucker off of Amazon, and this would run us about $10. If we were to mass produce this product, we wouldn't obviously buy the circles. We would have sheets of neoprene that we were to cut, so that would cut down on the production cost a little bit. And for the adhesive, we use E6000 glue. I actually already had the E6000 glue at my house, but if we were going to mass produce the product, we'd have to order it, and it would be about $0.09 cents per gram. So the total cost in the long run to produce the small cone set would be $11.72, and the total cost to produce the large cone set would be about $12.06. So here are the steps we went through in constructing our cone. After we catted each cone, we had to take it to the, to the 3D printer, which you can see in the top left-hand corner, and then we had to measure out our neoprene to make sure it fit the dimensions of our CAD. And then here is a failed trial up here in the top right corner. You can see little filaments of plastic sticking out. Um, so we had to either trim that up a little bit or completely start over with our um, 3D printing. And then we, after we cut the neoprene, we glued it to the plastic with the E6000. We started off gluing the inside layer and then the outside layer. And then we waited 40 hours for it to solidify. But we put two layers of glue on just to make sure the glue was durable enough and was going to be waterproof. So we ended up waiting about 96 hours for the glue to solidify for each cone. And then we ended up trimming the neoprene, the excess, around the edge of the cone. Um, so for three out of the four of the cones, we used scissors to cut the neoprene. And then the fourth cone, we used the laser cutter. And we found that that was much more efficient in cutting the excess and it looked a lot nicer. So in the future, we would end up laser cutting all of our neoprene for the cones. And then this is what we ended up with right here. Here's a video of me testing out our product.
slide your wrist through and then pull it up a little bit so that it like, go, and then it should just sit tightly on the wrist. <laughs> that was our goal. test which we tested if 95% of the water um, that runs down your arms could be stopped by the um, device that we created. So originally we were going to do two trials, a five second one and a seven second one, but then after um, having people test it out and talking to them about how long they usually wash their face, um, we realized that we needed to add another trial which was a 12 second trial. And as you can tell from all of our data, all of them passed within the range of um, the 95% stopping. So this was our glued durability test. As I mentioned before, our product needed to have a lifespan of three years. And so to test this, if you wash your face once a day for three years, it equals 1,095 times. So we put the cones, both the small and large cone, on and off our hand 1,095 times. And both of our cones passed the glue durability test. We noticed no wear and tear within the glue, no leakage, no holes in the glue, and it was, it passed the test. And then our third test was the activation test, just to see how long it would take for someone to put on the cone. So originally in our general specifications, we said that it should take less than two minutes to put on, and um, they all passed being within three to five seconds of being able to put it on. So we didn't have to do any uh, modification cycles within this. So in the long run, we learned a lot through working through this project and finding a final product. We learned that it takes a lot to research even for a small product like ours. And we also have some changes that we would like to make if we were to mass produce this product in the future. So for the neoprene, we would end up having sheets of neoprene that we would cut with the laser cutter to cut down on production costs. And we would also order the glue in a bulk amount. And to test the lifespan of our product, we'd like to test it over three years to see if it could have a longer lifespan than three years to fit our consumer needs. So to test that, we would like to see if it could get more of like a five-year lifespan or a 10-year lifespan. And uh, we would like to thank our mentors for helping us out throughout this year. Um, you guys are a great help. And um, So we were just testing them on and off, so we would put it on our hand and then take it off, and that would count as one time. Are, are these the units that we tested the bottom line? Yes. Um, yeah, so we had one set that we just did, um, one of the small ones and one of the large ones that we consistently. So uh, can I build you off Jen's question because I thought the same thing. Do you think that um, water and or the chemicals, the soap that people use, would, you know, would have an impact on the neoprene or anything, or is that for you? I think it could possibly impact it, but the E6000 glue was pretty strong when we were just like constantly um, doing the trials. But that would be a good idea in the future to add a test that would do it with the glue, or with soap. I think definitely if we added like a 5 year lifespan or a 10 year lifespan, then you would definitely test that out with soap and water to see if it had any effect on the glue. Just the putting on and taking off, the effect it would have on the paper, would it rip over time? Yeah, I think usually they last pretty well for around like 10 years, but then after a while they start to. Especially, you not said did these over a thousand times? Right? Yes. Yeah, so that's what I was just looking at. You can't even tell if there's anything there yet. So mm -hmm. that's very neat. Are you guys using these? Um, we, I think it would be a great idea to implement these in our daily lives. And one of our, one of the mentors at Pine Lake was mentioning to us how it could be used for other things like washing dishes. 
when you have like long sleeves, so maybe we could use it for something like that. I think that would be cool. It's always very irritating when water gets like everywhere when you're washing dishes. But yeah, what's great about this product is like it's in everyday use, so it's like it's not um, it's not going to be as specific as like other products, where it's like say if you don't have a car and they build a backup camera like here. But yeah, everyone has a sink, hopefully. <laughs> what was the biggest thing you learned in doing this project? Um. Well, the biggest thing that we learned for me was that like there is obviously a lot that goes into a project, and that like. It's crazy to see something like in its final solution. Like at the beginning of the year, I didn't realize like what we were even gonna do, but there's so much that goes into it with like making adjustments and um, trying to like visualize and end result. I also didn't realize how many brainstorms we actually had to go through to get where we are now. Yeah, it's a lot of drawing. <laughs> If we have a, if they have a picture with you guys. Oh, yeah, of course, sure. Thank you so much for your help. Do you want to go up here really quick, Ellen? Oh. Wherever, wherever you want to go. Whatever these are. Thank you guys for taking so much time. Hey, Oh, you get a photo? Oh, if you choose. Yes, I'll stand right here. Yeah, and then I'll report here. Count so I can suck in my belly. Still picking it up. Yeah, I'll smile right now. I had all my mentors here, so I was like, I'm not going to go How many times have you guys done this? Just last year in this year, so uh, our son was in first grade. Yeah, so. yeah. kindergarten. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 You're going to go that way? Yeah, that's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even think they presented. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, I think they did. Like, but it's also yeah. successful. Did you catch the end of that one? Was that an interesting product? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's I was, what I, I was always think of the latex gloves because you know, I just I bought a pair of latex gloves for the first time in my life. I've never, I've never owned them. And I was looking at the package, and it, it, they're designed to have uh, to curl it up. They, they actually have, they actually advertise that you're supposed to curl it up so that when the water yeah, goes yeah, down, it's probably going to shoot. Fantastic! I had to do it. That was a group you almost got. You know, I always assign the consumer the best product to the best consumer-related group because I know that's one of your niches. Hello, doing great, doing great. How are you? So far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a bit of a celebration, right? I'm nervous. I'm nervous for them, but in the end, it's a celebration of their years. I keep, you know, we've got some really good products that the students are presenting. And we, I mean, I've seen them 15 times. You know? <laughs> Hello, Hello, next customer slash victims. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hello. 
How are you, dude? Good to see you. No, no, jump it. Grab a clipboard, dude. You're a judge. Okay, good. Start until ten thirty, so I don't want to start too far ahead of time. 
I'm very popular. You may not know that. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know if the tech department set all this up. So. I have no way of knowing how many people are actually watching. Maps sure is. No, there's no way you can talk to me. I I had a conversation with Max via Mara's phone about uh, doing a better job of staying in touch with his sister. Oh, good for you. <laughs> he never answered. <laughs> he didn't answer. No, he never did he answer Mr. Walker? Of course. Of course. It's not me. You just have to pose as Mr. Walker next time. I know. Yell at him. Well, Mara, you said he's got one. I see it. Sometimes it might be my fault. Okay, so we have two people watching. Ooh, big man. Big guy. One of them is me. So <laughs> one of them is me. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. Did you do a shout out? The other person is the tech department. <laughs> but just in case a parent could come or something, you know, it's nice to have um, that's the ability to allow them. All right, here's our. <laughs> no, you're not like, uh, We just ran over the head skip. Uh, so there's <laughs> Hello. Thank you everybody for coming. My name is Fiona and this is Mara and today we're going to be showing you our capstone presentation, Save the Sets. Hi, my name is Mara Vicario. I've been going to Pine Lake since kindergarten and I'll be attending Chapel Hill in the fall to study communication. My name is Fiona Reed. I've also been at, the lower, er, at Pine Lake since the lower school and I'll be attending NC State in the fall to study environmental engineering. Isn't it so annoying when you're in the shower trying to get shampoo out of the bottle, but you just can't get it out? You know there's still product in the bottle, but nothing's coming out of the pump? Well, maybe you try to bang it against your hand, or try to keep pumping it until just enough comes out. Or maybe you just throw the whole bottle away. Well, Fiona and I have both struggled with this problem, and we've come up with a solution so you'll never have to deal with this again. So in our presentation today, we're going to talk about why we chose this problem, show you our problem statement, some research we did, how we planned and prototyped, how we tested our final prototype, and what results we got from those tests. So why did we choose to work on shampoo waste? This is a personal problem that both Fiona and I have dealt with in the past, and after doing research and talking to our peers, we realized that we aren't the only people that struggle with this, and there aren't many products on the market right now that solve this problem. 
So our problem again is shampoo being left behind in pump shampoo bottles and research has been done to show that 5 to 25 percent of that shampoo gets wasted. Our, goal, our target audience is the over 300 million Americans that use shampoo and struggle with this problem and with our final product we hope to reduce the dollar amount of that is wasted along with consumer frustration. So we started by surveying some of our peers and asking them how much shampoo do you feel like is left in the bottle when the pump is no longer usable? And the average answer was one to five percent or six to ten percent. So this showed us that this is a problem and there a solution does need to be found. The next question we asked was how much money households spend annually on shampoo? And the most common answer we got was in the 150 to 200 range. This is a lot of money and we believe that if we were able to eliminate all waste and make every drop of the shampoo usable, we would be able to reduce that amount. We then asked our peers how much would you be willing to spend on a product that would get all the shampoo out of the bottle. And the average answer was 5 to $10, which shows that we need to keep it at a lower budget because a lot of the products on the market right now are over $10. We did some more research and found these couple articles that re-emphasize that this is a problem. This first one by Ben Gardina, he talks about the millions of bottles that get wasted with and thrown away with shampoo in it. So if we were to, if we had a way to eliminate all this waste, it would make it a lot simpler and save a lot of waste. Similarly, in the second one by Samantha Cohen, she talks about how shampoo being left in the bottles makes the recycling process very complicated. So if there was a way to eliminate all that waste, we would be able to save time for the recycling process. So we then started with our personal research and Fiona actually brought in a bottle of conditioner that she'd been using. She knew there was still product left in the bottle, but it was no longer coming out with the pump. So we decided to weigh it and then we cut it open and we were really surprised to see how much conditioner was still left in the bottle. So this is what we saw when we first opened up the bottle. As you can see, there's still a lot there. So what we did was we took it all out and bagged it up, then washed the rest out so it was a clean, empty bottle. So we weighed that and found the difference and used that to compare it, or we converted that to the liters, then found the percentage left, which was 11.79%. That is a large percentage that is left behind, and I was able to bring that bag conditioner home and use it for like two to three more weeks. So then we started looking at past solutions and although this is a common problem, not many products have been made to solve it, but there are a lot of home improvement ways to fix it. Maybe you guys have tried some of them. One is actually cutting open the shampoo bottle with scissors and using a spatula to scoop it all out. While this is effective, it's also messy and very time consuming. Another home remedy is to take a half-use shampoo bottle on top of a full-use shampoo bottle and let it soak into the full bottle. And this is also cheap and there's no special um, devices needed, but it's also time consuming. And then finally we have a product that's actually on the market right now. This is mostly used for condiments and soap, but it's a stand that you can put your bottle on and the product goes from the top to the bottom. Um, this is easy to use and makes no mess, but it is $19.99, which again was more expensive than the people we surveyed said that they would want to spend on a product. Here we have some of the patents that we found. This first one is the spoon-shaped scraper, where consumers would take this spoon and scrape off the sides of the bottle or the bottom and get the amount of shampoo that they wanted to use. The problem with this is that they would likely have to cut open the bottle to get access to that shampoo. And it is also kind of short, so it would just be messy and not very user friendly. Similarly, the spatula-like apparatus, though it is longer, you would probably have to cut open that bottle to use it. And it's just messy and not very user friendly. Finally, we have the pump bottle with a straw and detachable bottom. This one was good because you wouldn't need to cut open the bottle or anything, except the you wouldn't be guaranteed to get anything off the sides. And also having that unscrewable bottom is just kind of a pain and not very easy to use. We then started looking at science and engineering concepts that revolved around shampoo bottles. And the first one was how the shampoo pump bottles work. 
And this is really important for us to learn because we had to know the different parts of the pump, so if we had to tweak it, we would know what to change. Then we started looking at the viscosity of shampoo because the thickness of it can determine how quickly it comes out of the bottle and if it sticks to the side or not. And then we learned how squeeze bottles worked because this was important in a lot of our brainstorms. We turned a pump bottle into a squeeze bottle, so we had to know how that would function. We'd like to take this moment to thank and recognize our expert advisor and mentor, Mr. Paquette. Thank you for coming. <laughs> he is an expert in consumer product development and he's helped us all throughout this year from brainstorming, designing, prototyping, and testing. He has also helped us with deciding what material we wanted to use, the pricing, and also just thinking about hypotheticals that would happen after this project. We then started brainstorming and these were our top three brainstorms we came up with. The first one was a removable topless stand, so when the pump is no longer working, you can remove the pump and place this top and stand, and the bottle will sit upside down and the product can go from the top to the bottom. Then we have a two-sided bottle, which when the pump is no longer working, a cap can be undone at the bottom of the bottle, and you can access the product that way. And then finally, we have a non-stick coating that can prevent shampoo from sticking to the sides of the bottle. Here we have our decision matrix where we compared all 10 of our brainstorms to the list of specifications we wanted to meet and highlighted our top three, which you saw in the previous slide. So the first of those three that we eliminated was the non-state coding. Realistically, with our time constraint and resources, that was just not a viable option for us. Also, it was more of a concern for squeeze bottles, we believe, and not pump bottles, which is what we wanted to target. The next one we eliminated was the two-ended bottle. This one, we did not think that consumers would want to spend that extra price with the bottle that they would be, they would end up throwing away anyways because it is like not reusable. So then we ended up with our replaceable top with stand. Then we moved on to our design specifications to determine what was most important that our product had. And our number one factor was the performance. We wanted our product to work in under 10 seconds and we also wanted to be able to get 0.5 ounces of shampoo out of the bottle. This 0.5 is what you would normally get out of a pump bottle. And we also wanted it to work on a standard size shampoo bottle, which is 32 ounces. Then we wanted our cost of our product to be in between $5 to $10, so it was still affordable for our consumers. Next, we wanted our product life. It was very important to us that it was durable and that it could last two, year, two or more years. And then finally, our customer needs. We wanted it to be affordable, easy to use, lightweight, and very efficient. So here's our CAD model of what we originally called the replaceable cap top with stand. As you can see, it looks a little different from our original brainstorm. We separate it into two parts here. This first one we call the cap, and that is the skirt. We have threading on the inside of both parts, so the cap screws directly onto the bottle, and the skirt screws onto that cap. This little triangle goes through that hole in the, in the skirt and seals so there is no leaking. And there are holes in the cap right there so that shampoo is still able to flow through. We then started our project plan and our budget. And when determining what materials we were going to use, we were deciding between polyethylene and polypropylene. Polyethylene is mostly used for shampoo bottles. So we ended up deciding with polypropylene, which is a harder plastic, and we needed about 0.15 pounds per product, and this is about 85 cents per pound, so it's still affordable and in our price range. Then the tools and equipment we needed were a 3D printer and CADing software, which we were lucky to have access to through Pine Lake STEM program. And then the needed knowledge, we got help from Mr. Paquette and Mr. Walker. Um, we learned how to use a 3D printer, and they helped us with CADing, and they especially helped us with threading, which was definitely a trial and error process. So we have here our product cost, 12.75 cents. This is, however, only the cost of the plastic per product. So with that, we took into account the cost of transportation, manufacturing, and packaging as well. And with that, we estimated about 80 cents per product. So we have our retail price there, 4.99, because in our survey, consumers said they would pay five to ten dollars. So that would easily make that range even below it and allow us a profit also. We then started working on actually constructing it in a 3D printer, and to do this, we exported CAD files one and two, which was our skirt and our cap. 
and an STL file, and then we used the 3D printer. Ours was the monoprice voxel. We used a 25% infill and three shells. Here we have our construction details for our consumers. So the first step is to remove that original pump once it is almost empty and you can't use it anymore, and replace that with the cap. You can then screw the skirt onto the cap and seal it so there are no gaps. Then tip it upside down and stick it on the side of your shower. So we weren't kidding when we said this was a trial and error process. Here's our formal apology to Mr. Walker. Thank you so much for helping us and being patient with us. We definitely had to take a lot of attempts at this. But now we're going to show you how it works. And if we have any volunteers or judges, you can try it out with us. So the first step, I said, is to remove this original pump. <laughs> okay, so we start with unscrewing the pump bottle and taking out the pump. And then we screw on our cap. And then we screw in our skirt. Okay, and then you're going to flip the product upside down so that's how it would sit in your shower. Okay, then you're going to twist it. And then you can squeeze to get the product out. And when you have enough, you can turn it and close it. And then it stops coming out. The first test we did, the first test we did with our prototype was a weight test. This was kind of an unofficial one, but we wanted to make sure that if our consumers wanted to, they could replace it immediately and use the full shampoo bottle. So we put a 10 pound weight on it, and as you can see, there was no damage, and it was still able to withstand that weight without tipping over or damaging at all. So since our performance was our number one design specification we wanted to meet, we made sure to test this. And we did this by removing the pump and putting our product on the bottle and then setting a timer for 10 seconds. And if it passed the test, it would get 0.5 ounces of shampoo out of the bottle because that was what you would normally get out of a pump bottle. And then if not, it failed. So here's us performing the test. We weighed an empty cup first performed our test for 10 seconds, and then waited again to find the difference. We found that the difference in the shampoo was 16.59 ounces, which is equivalent to 0.585 ounces, so it passed the test. The next test we did was our drop test to ensure we had good durability and product life, because those were, again, specifications we definitely wanted to meet. So what we did was we started with one foot and dropped it onto a hard tile surface all the way up to five. 
we put it onto a empty bottle but put some clay in it so that it replicated some weight in the bottle as if there was real shampoo in it. So you can see we started here at one foot and went all the way up to five. What we found was our product did not break until the fifth trial. We do, however, believe this is because of the 3D printed material and it is more like brittle. So we strongly believe that if it was a polypropylene prototype, it would not break under any of these circumstances. Next, we wanted to test how our product would work in a full humidity. So we tried to mimic shower-like conditions. A shower can typically go from 60 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So we set an incubator to about 54.4 degrees which is equivalent to 130 degrees, and we put our product in there for 15 minutes with a beaker of water. We ended up having to alter this experiment a little bit because our incubator would only get to about 45 degrees, so it was equivalent to 111 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we ended up putting it in the incubator for 45 minutes, so we made sure it would really be okay in a very long shower. And here are our results. Um, there was no damage, it didn't melt, and the only noticeable difference was that the color changed because we used a color changing threading in the 3D printer. So here's just a quick project summary. There's our final product. We learned so much about this product or this project through brainstorming, coming up with an idea, and really seeing it come to life. We learned a lot about threading, catting, 3D printing. And we're just really thankful for this experience because we feel like we learned about the engineering process and what it means to be an engineer. We wanted to thank you all again for coming. Thank Mr. Paquette and Mr. Walker for helping us throughout this entire year with this process. And to thank our parents for supporting us, our judges, and then our two peers in the back there for coming and supporting us. If there's anyone on camera, you too. <laughs> Yes, if you have any questions, we can answer those now. Okay, so that, that one was a foaming shampoo, or was it just, it's, it's just a regular one? Was it foam? Um, I don't think so. I think that's just a normal shampoo bottle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the threading, like, are all shampoo bottles have a universal thread type that does it work on a shampoo bottle? Yeah, so we use the um, standard 32 ounce shampoo bottle. I am sure there's some like specific brands that have a little different, but we use like the universal one, like we tried our best. So I'm sure there are some that are a little different, but for the most part, this should work for most 32 ounce shampoo bottles. I have a question about grading. Who was the first Pine Lake student to ever successfully 3D print threaded material? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about some of your prototypes. What were the issues that you had to correct? Yes, so we struggled a lot with the threading and finding the right balance between actually fitting on the bottle. We kept struggling. It was either too big or too small. The skirt wouldn't fit on the cap. So it was just a lot of trial and error. Well, this one we did was for shampoo, but we believe it could also work for conditioner and other shower products like, you know, just body wash, anything with probably a little more um, edits because of the viscosity of conditioner compared to shampoo. So mostly shower products like that. How, how would viscosity play in things? Like if I put this on a ketchup bottle, would it... I mean, does everything get off the sides? It's probably just like a little thicker, so like you'd have to squeeze a little harder, like we'd make the hole bigger probably. But the goal is that it would work for that too. <laughs> Last call? I have two questions. Yes. Um, you can stand back and look at this product and say it's pretty simple, like I mean, it's two parts, it's Twist it, but you learned it's not that easy, right? What was the most frustrating to you part of this whole process? Um, the most frustrating part was the threading again. <laughs> we struggled with this a lot. At first, we like had it backwards because I don't know when you first create it, you think they have to go opposite ways. They don't. They go the same way. Um, and then the sizing also was a big problem for us. We just like 
kept having to change tiny little things. So that's why we have so many prototypes. And then, yeah, it was just trial and error, so it just took us a lot of time, which was frustrating. It makes you appreciate the detail that goes into the simplest products that are out there on the Yes, definitely. Uh, so so um, I guess related to your question, or there's uh, not necessarily focus on other applications, but if you kept going on this, like if you started your own company and made this, what would you do next? That's a very good question. We'd probably focus on just expanding it and working with other materials, like you said, like maybe moving into condiments and other items. And definitely how you talked about the different size bottles. We'd have sizes that really work for all the different bottles on the market. Against mold, is that what you Yes, so we were definitely going to include a cleaning manual for how to really clean the product. Because if it wasn't a shower like other shower products, eventually mildew would probably build up. So we would include um, cleaning instructions in our product. How would you respond to a person who said, that doesn't look like it took much time to develop? What would you say? <laughs> we would show them all of our prototypes. <laughs> All right, anybody else? All right, thank you, girls. Thank you, Ed.
project, like I said, starts to kill me the restroom, give them time to clear out. Um, no, oh, cool. Use one for text. I love your time. That's the one I want to see. Whoever bought it, they did. It's all kind of Texas, so it's better, right? And you're going to be there. I don't know how to give you grief on that one. Oh, I do. I do have some. And my dog, though. And my dog, too. There's one right here. Mike? Oh, the scouting. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good one. 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 Should I just stuck my hand in this?
you can give me that advice. I heed it, I promise. I said, okay, I gotta get to the point where they're saying, hey there, this is how much it costs to build the board. This is how much it's plastic. Oh, the you know, they just have to be this year. And it takes a while. Yeah, we played this weekend. We did some carry. We'll drive out there and bring some gas. <laughs> yeah, I was looking to. But it should be okay. As long as they win everything on Friday, that way we'll see overnight on Saturday of uh, the gas trucks coming in. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's all individual. So we'll try a bunch of rally chargers on um, every search triangle. I know I know Charlie I really good and Franklin Academy. They're all right there. They're all there. No new faces. So it's a different All right, you guys ready to uh, hop up? Yeah. I'm at, I can just make it. Oh, yeah. He's a little white. Yeah, no, uh, Mr. Rose, did you get, yeah, you need a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I took you all a second. <laughs> <laughs> kindergarten. Um, I'll be attending chapel in the fall to study either business or political science. I'm Carson Turpin. I am going to be attending the University of Oklahoma this fall. I'm going to be studying business there and I've been at Piling since kindergarten as well. Uh, our goal our goal is to create a compartment that could carry around uh, appropriate cleaning items for your glasses. Many people go to the beach uh, on vacation and they never have anything to clean their glasses if they drop it in stuff like sand that's going to scratch their glasses. Uh, they resort to using other things that aren't safe for their glasses, and then they have to end up replacing them. Why did we choose this topic? We thought it was necessary to have an appropriate cleaning item when you're walking around anywhere, have it with you on the go. We personally scratch our glasses or our phones using the wrong product, cleaning our phones or even our glasses. <laughs> we feel lots of people carry necessities to um, bring their debit cards, their credit cards with them. So we felt like, why not do the same thing with a microfiber cloth or a gla appropriate glass cleaner? 
Uh, so this is a problem statement. Uh, roughly 60% of people wear um, any kind of eyeglasses any day. Uh, so we wanted to make a product, as I said, that could um, make sure that they don't scratch their glasses so our product would be more tender towards those people. Uh, the demographic seems to go more towards males as females tend to come more prepared whenever they're on uh, vacation. Uh, they don't drop their stuff as much. Our justifications that roughly 85% of people are using their t-shirts, their towels, their um, glad to clean their glasses. And we also know that glasses will be scratched, which leads to the purchase of new glasses, which is not very cheap. And that scratches on glasses can make everyday life irritating and make you annoyed. So these are uh, some results we got from a survey we conducted of roughly 25 people, uh, our classmates, friends, and family. So as you can see up here, roughly 91% of people never bring the appropriate cleaning item with them when they're on the go, uh, running errands, whatever they, that might be. Um, some people do, but uh, never fully, only about 50% of the time. And then you can see how this reflects uh, on this next chart, because roughly 35% of people have had to replace their lens or buy new glasses. And even though that's not the majority, that's a lot of money that's being spent uh, when you really don't have to spend that money. An existing solution is the Chemtech wipes. Mr. Walker has these. They are used in lavatories. They clean very small particles on your glasses. They absorb liquid very well. But there are many cons. Like they're very rough. They're very thin and dry. Like if you feel one, they tear very easily, and they, the cost adds up over time. Uh, so then there's microfiber cloths, uh, which is in our product. Uh, they're recommended for glasses. Uh, if you get a pretty good pair of glasses, whether it be sunglasses or eyeglasses, it's almost always going to come with a microfiber cloth. Uh, they don't scratch the lens, which is very important um, when you want to get those particles off. And they're also good with liquid. They pick up up to seven times their weight. Uh, the only problem is they're a hassle to carry around, and um, the ones for the glasses are very small. So if they fall out of your pocket, you're probably going to lose them. Another existing solution is a multi-layered attachment to your glasses. These are very easy when they get dirty, you can just peel them right off. And they're very easy to transport when they're already on your glasses. But when you don't, when you have to take one off, it does take time to pull one back on as they must be applied very precisely and perfectly on your glasses. Uh, so we used two different concepts during this project. Uh, one was material science, so we had to choose the material for not only our compartment, but what we wanted inside our compartment to actually clean your glasses. Uh, so we had to choose between like Chemtech wipes, uh, microfiber cloth, and a spray. Uh, ultimately, we went up uh, with the uh, cloth, but we'll get into more of the materials for the compartment later on uh, because we did a little more uh, thinking through that process than with our cleaning items. And then we also used mechanical engineering, so using a uh, website called OnShape, it's a CAD website created the CAD, 3D printed it, and then had to put it together, uh, glue these magnets, which you'll see uh, when we demo it. So we had to put all that together as well. Our design constraints consisted of a $50 budget given to us by Mr. Walker. We had a $15 max price on our product. As you see here on the survey, this was asked, what is the maximum price you'd be willing to pay for our solution? The mean was about $15, so we thought that'd be a good price to limit ourselves to. And we also did not want to violate or copy any patents on Google or any website. Yeah, so these are some of our design specifications. Um, as you see, we thought performance was very important. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could clean our product in roughly 20 seconds or less. Uh, we felt that uh, if we didn't reach that time frame, that people wouldn't actually like to use our product. It might get uh, might be too much for them, uh, too much of a hassle to clean it if it takes too long. Uh, we also wanted to make sure it was the right uh, height or not height, uh, weight and size because obviously you don't want something that's clunky on the back of your phone. Uh, you want it to be comfortable uh, and you want to make sure it's not uh, too thick or it's going to be hard to carry around. And then lastly, we thought materials were very important. Um, as I said earlier, we had to choose between three different materials for a compartment. Uh, that will be on the next slide. But we wanted to uh, kind of fit that uh, size and weight description. Uh, we didn't want the material to be heavy. We wanted it to be lightweight uh, and durable as well in case you drop your phone. 
So the material we selected was the ABS plastic. It was a very flexible, lightweight, durable material. It could take falls. Had good impact on resistance. The cons that it was not good for the environment as it was made out of oil. And when you were printing it, it had high, hot plastic fumes when it was printing. Yeah, and we also used silicone, uh, or we thought about using it. Um, silicone is very good. It's very versatile. Uh, it's very durable. It won't break at all if you drop it. Uh, it'll stretch really easily without tearing. Um, so it's like one of the best products to have on the back of your phone. Many people use it to hold their debit or credit cards, maybe their IDs. Uh, the only problem is it's very hard to mold if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and our mentor said that he, he, uh, he had people that he knew who could help us with that. But we got a little behind and uh, with the amount of time that we had left, uh, we just didn't want to have to keep doing the process over and over if we couldn't perfect it the first time. And then we also thought about leather. Um, that was kind of a backup plan in case everything went really wrong. Uh, leather obviously is very high quality. Um, it can be quite expensive and we didn't really know much about how to get it the shape that we wanted. We felt like that might be tough so it was never really a big option just there in case. Our cost of our product was roughly $4.75. But we spent about $12 on the madness because like, they come in really big bags. But we only used about a dollar worth because we only put a couple of them on our product. Same story with the microfiber cloths. We bought a bag of them, but we only used one in our product, so it was roughly about $2. The other three were given to us by Mr. Walker. But if we did have to average out the price, this would be our amount used in our total cost. Yeah, so this is our, uh, I want to go over the budget. We didn't talk about what we spent our $50 on. Uh, we spent it on the silicon mold. Uh, me and Carson and our mentor were dead set on doing a uh, silicon mold, so our mentor said, yeah, I think you guys should go ahead and uh, buy that product, so we did. Um, and then I think he got down to about two months left in the project and we did some research and it just didn't seem viable. Uh, it would have been hard to get on the first try and it ended up being very expensive, so a group in the future can use it if they want. Um, and also we bought adhesive tape, uh, which we use Mr. Walker's adhesive tape, but the ones that we use kind of help spark that idea to end up using the adhesive tape. Um, we could have used it just as well. And then our plan was really easy. All we had to do, once we didn't want to do the silicone, we decided to go with that 3D CAD, uh, which had to CAD it on shape, um, 3D print it out, uh, attach the magnets uh, via super glue, and then make sure everything worked properly. Um, our mentor was Mr. Troutman. Uh, he teaches mechatronics at Mitchell Community College. Uh, he was helpful so much during the process. He, uh, he gave us multiple ideas. He was the one that came up with that magnet idea. Uh, we were at Panera Bread. So he was just fabulous during the whole process. He really encouraged us. He always checked in to see how we were. Our product, which is seen here on the right side of the screen, at the top you can see the white uh, plastic piece. That is our top of our product. On each corner we have two magnets that would attach to the bottom piece, which is the green plastic. That has three magnets in each corner. As you see, the thing it's attached to is a makeshift phone that was used for our drop test, as we did not want to drop a real phone. So we weighed it out, made sure it was the same weight, and did the drop test with that. Yeah, and I'll come down. I can show you guys the product, uh, demonstrate what it does, and then pass it around. There's this top piece right here. You see all four corners of both the top and bottom piece have magnets um, so they connect that way. And then we have these makeshift phones the same way, obviously on the same size, but we put the clean product in there. Attaches to your phone via that piece of tape, just like any other phone application. And yeah, that's just that way. So this is our CAD. Um, we have the assembly up here on the left, this is on on shape, and then we have the two different pieces. 
so we had to make sure that the edges were round and that they weren't pointy because you wouldn't want something jagging into you um, while it's sitting there in your pocket. Uh, you want it to be comfortable. And we had to get the sizes just right because if one's a little too small or a little too big, um, it's just not going to work properly and it's going to come apart. The magnets won't actually connect together. It'll cause all kinds of problems. This is our assembly CAD drawing. This is a, just, just it all together. There's an isometric, a front view, a top view. So we had three different tests that we wanted to conduct with our product. Uh, a drop test, obviously people drop their phones all the time. We wanted to make sure that it didn't break when you dropped it. Um, none of the magnets came apart, anything like that. Uh, we also conducted a cleaning test. So we uh, did five trials of cleaning our uh, big set of lab glasses. We want to make sure we could at least do some big lab glasses comfortably, um, take our time with it in under 20 seconds. And then we also had a comfort test. So we asked 30 people to rate the comfortability, bulkiness, and if it was easy to take in, side and out of their pockets. And uh, actually for the drop test, we dropped it four times in four different increments, uh, between one to four feet. So when we were dropping at the first foot, the, the uh, results were very impressive. No damage, no scratches, no problems with it at all. At two feet, same story. No damage, no problems, could take it. Three feet, same thing, no problems at all. But then we got to four feet, and it got a little iffy. Sometimes uh, it would come apart. And one time, the last drop, the uh, magnet fell off, but we weren't sure if it was the glue or not. But with that, we decided to add a magnet to all the corners of the bottom piece to help it keep attached when falling because it would, it would come apart. So we thought that'd be the best option. Yeah, so then we had our comfort, uh, comfortability test results. So as I said, we had 30 people. Obviously, for reasons we can't display all 30 of them on a slideshow, but uh, this is a good, I feel like it's a good excerpt from it. Um, all 30 people said it was comfortable and all 30 said it was easy to put in their pockets. Uh, the only thing was about a little more than half said it was uh, there was a medium bulkiness, and then the other half said there was no bulkiness. Um, but most of the people we talked to said that if it was actually on a real phone, it wouldn't have bothered them. It was just that uh, those large metal pieces that are under it. Uh, but just in case we tried to sand it down, it didn't end up doing anything in the end. But we just wanted to try it anyways. Our cleaning results were very um, impressive as every test was under the goal of 20 seconds with the lowest being around 15, the highest being 19. As you can see, the results were perfect, so we made no changes to this aspect of the proto. We are going to recognize Mr. Troutman today for all of his work and being there every last minute we had him. He was met us one time at Panera Bread and we talked to him for a couple hours with his kids. He even came with his kids too, which thank him for everything he did for us. Also, Mr. Walker for pushing us through this year. Even though we'd be a little lazy most of the year, he'd always get on me during class. Even though it was online, he'd join our, he'd join our uh, breakout room and be like, get, get on us, and then me and Colin start working better. So. Uh, I also like to thank my dad. He helped pay for uh, the two things that we needed to buy outside of class. Uh, he helped also generate some ideas. Um, his ideas were very similar to Mr. Troutman's, so that was helpful to have two different voices uh, encouraging some of those ideas. And we'd also like to thank some of our classmates who participated in the survey and participated in the tests that we did, uh, because without them, we wouldn't have any information to back up that, it's, that this product was worth uh, pursuing, and we wouldn't have any information on our comfortability test. So thank you to all those people. Uh, so what we learned throughout the year was that our compartment was actually pretty successful. We thought with about two months left, we didn't know if it was going to be successful. Mr. Walker can attest to that. Um, but we, we went through the design and testing process, which at first you see all those assignments and you're like, oh my god, what am I going to do? But once the ideas start circulating, it's not actually that hard uh, to make your product better and better. Now if we were to continue this project, uh, whether it be for fun or as a real product, I think that we would turn more to improving the magnet system. So maybe uh, getting some more durable magnets that will stay in place, finding a way to keep them in place and uh, to prevent it from falling off. 
I think we'd increase the uh, number of materials that we would use and the uh, number of designs and colors that we could use on it as well, uh, as well as working on the thickness. Uh, again, some people said that there was like a medium bulkiness. Uh, I think we could probably get that down if we just worked on the cat a little bit. So um, that's the end. Any questions? Anything you guys want to add? No, it, it does not. Okay. And then my other question is, do you consider the space in the, in the container for like dirt I could get in there? Because if you want the if you want the microfiber piece to be clean, there's a lot of space in there. Uh yeah. So I don't think we kind of considered that. Um, like you mean like the dirt that would get in it if it yeah, got there? Just like regular use, you know. You microfiber because there's no seal, like there's no seal around it, so. Yeah, so the good thing with microfiber, if you've ever like used some of the ones for the eyeglasses, uh, even if they get the particles on them, they come off really easily. So you can just wipe it off or you can just like, yeah, you can take off the particles really easily. Same with the liquid, you can wring it out really easily and it'll just work just the same. We, um, we also had a wet cloth in there, so we put two cloths in there to make sure both would fit when we were making our cat. So we measured out two cloths that so would be perfectly fitting. Yeah, two quick ones. <clears throat> One, I, I, I thought about this because I just recently purchased for my iPhone a magnetic wallet, the 12 to and my debate was, I was carried in the front pocket, like you guys tested, um, but when, and it stays on great, but when you pull it out, did you look into that at all? And like when you pull it out of pocket? I know you looked at putting it in. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we forgot to mention is that it was actually a test if it was easy to take in and pull out. And, uh, okay. So it was both, yeah. Okay. And then second, the history person, not a science person, is the fact that Phones like the 12 have magnetic backing. Would that affect your magnets in any way over time? Or do you envision any issues there? We're not really sure on that. Okay. But. Well, I think, personally, uh, as I said, if we were to continue it um, with the newer phones, I think you could probably make a product that adapts to that. Okay. Uh, those new cases that I have one that you're talking about. Um, but for now, we haven't really thought about that now.
about is I'll try to sleep away the three four weeks. So I tweaked it, but no, you're you're right. I should I should definitely have an adjustment. Yeah. Yeah.
the I was the I was the I was the black sheep. Don't worry, you're fine. I turned out okay. <laughs>
course I'm coming. Uh, just, just to check in case I get noticed. Hey, Carson. Hey. All righty. You guys have the largest audience out of everyone. Yes. <laughs> Let's go. All right, we have our four judges ready. Parents ready. Students are quiet and watching. It's on you guys. All right, here's our project, uh, Dogs in Darkness by Carson DeQuick and Parker Dotson. I'm Carson. I'm Carson DeQuick, and I'm going to be attending NC State for Mechanical Engineering, and right now I'm a senior at Pine Lake. Uh, I'm Parker Dodson. I'm a senior right now at Pine Lake Prep, and I'm also attending NC State for Engineering. And on the right, you see Lucy. She is 11 years old, and about three years ago, she was diagnosed with SARS, and out of nowhere, uh, she suddenly became blind. And she was our idea for this project because um, there was nothing on the market to help blind dogs, like to navigate or to be safe when navigating around the house. So. Lucy was our idea. Raise our hands. Who here has a, a beloved pet that they just love? <laughs> well, what, ha what would happen if they turned blind? Like, what would you do? Well, this was kind of the situation with me and Parker as we had to figure out something to do with Lucy as she turned blind two years ago. For the problem statement, um, Oh, in the U.S., over 300,000 dogs about are blind, and this is a big problem for both the dogs and the homeowners, as the dogs can easily injure themselves because they can just run into an object or a wall, and that causes harm to them. And this is a problem for the owners because they um, they have to like accommodate their house, and it just they have to spend more time and more money and more resources on the dog. And uh, Carson and I found a couple web articles um, on blind dogs just to find uh, where we should start from. And in both of these web articles we found that there are no real solutions with uh, helping blind dogs. And also one found that the dogs need like a device. They like the like there's not a device on the market yet to help with seeing or that sort of thing. And also the other one said to slowly expose those blind dogs to new environments. For our first solution that we found online, it was the muffin's halo. It's a little halo that goes like on top of the dog's head and it doesn't really like do much in my opinion. Like if a dog is walking towards an object or a wall, then like it could like feel the top of it like when it hits it but other than that like it's not really going to stop the dog's momentum and then it also costs a lot of money as you can see eighty dollars to hundred forty dollars and that's just way too expensive and our product is better than that because it will alert the dog further in advance of when an object or a wall is right there and also it will be less money and then for the other two existing solutions we found, we found an object detecting device and they're basically sunglasses with sensors on each side and what they do is if there's an object incoming from each side or one of the sides that that side would buzz and so this was a great product except for it is expensive and costed around $120 and also they were made for humans and they, there's no uh, device for dogs. And the other um, solution we found were bumpers, and these are great because they're cheap, and they can help protect the dog from severe injuries from running into corners and that sort of thing, but uh, they do not protect the dog from running into walls, and also they're just soft uh, bumpers, so they can still the dog can still get injured from hitting the corners of the house or chair, whatever. For the laws and codes that we found, we researched a bunch of them, but we can only find uh, the international regulations for animal product exports. And that's just like saying that the export of the product cannot harm the dog. It cannot like 
be used in a way to cause like disruption for the dog. And then we also found FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine that regulates like the food, the drugs, the devices and whatnot used on the dog so it can also not harm it. And we have to be ethically responsible for it so we create a product that uh, will, is comfortable for the dog and does not cause any disruption. And then for our experts, we found our mentor, uh, Mr. McCrudden, and a blind dog owner, Ms. Selva. And he has been a mentor at Pine Lake for a few years now, so we knew that he was going to be a great help. And also, he is a software engineer, so we knew that he was going to help us with programming our device. And also, uh, finding our materials on the web and that sort of thing. And Ms. Selva helped us because she is an owner of a blind dog, and she gave our family and myself a different idea of what it was like or what she does in her house to help her dog navigate and that sort of thing. For the parameters that we put on the, our, like for our device, um, we have 13 in total, but like the three main ones, performance, durability, maintenance, and size and weight, all like for the most substantial because to perform like the performance of it, it needs to be good and needs to work so the product will actually help the dog so that it doesn't harm itself and then for durability and maintenance like if the dog runs into a wall or object we want to make sure that the like device does not break and then for the size and weight we want to make sure that like if it does um, like go on top of the dog and it doesn't like fall off and whatnot, that it doesn't strain the dog's head and cause it any discomfort. And so we combine like the halo idea with the sunglasses sensor idea to make one ultrasonic device that would use an ultrasonic sensor to uh, navigate and help the dog because what an ultrasonic sensor does is it detects how far away an object is and so our device beeps whenever uh, the device gets too close to an object and what we do is we strap the device to the dog's head and then whenever the dog would get too close to an object uh, it would start beeping so then the dog would know it was close to like a wall or some other object. And then for constructing we first we had our mentor help us with finding uh, our different materials that we would need like in our breadboard as you can see there with our wires and our uh, Arduino and ultrasonic sensor. We found those, we found those products and then after we ordered them we used the breadboard for sizing for our CAD model because we knew that that part was going to be the biggest piece in our CAD model. And then after we found the breadboard size we put the wires together into the breadboard and programmed the breadboard and then after we programmed the breadboard, we made our first CAD model, and then after we made some enhancements, we, you can see the final design here, and then up, and up front you can see our initial design and then our final design. And after that, we put the Velcro through the straps and strapped it onto Lucy and did, provided our tests. And then as you can see here, here are a few images of our CAD model. As you can see, there's the, um, there is the slit right there, and then there's a slit in the back. The slit on the top is used for Velcro to strap around the dog's head. And then the slit in the back is used to strap to the collar. So then there's two points where the uh, headpiece or the housing unit is uh, staying still and it doesn't move. And also, as you can see from the front image right here, that's the hole that you can, uh, or the ultrasonic sensor uses to open out and see like the, and detect the other objects. And then you can also see from the back right here, this is where the door goes that we made. And that slides in right over the top. And you can also see that there is a little curved area right here, but the door is flat on the top and that is used for plugging in the battery to operate the housing unit in the device. And for the production of our product, it's about $13.80. As from what you can see, we have a list of items with the prices next to it, and then like with the Velcro and noodle foam, 
That zero dollars means we were given that in the classroom and through Mr. Walker. And for our first prototype, uh, we created like a box, but that obviously we changed that. And we changed it because it looks more aesthetically pleasing now than it did. And it like every time like the back part we would do, it was just like fall off. And then also for like the box, it was like a greater area. And, and that means that there's more weight being put onto the dog. So we would switch that up. And here is our video. First, do you want me to show it? And then, if you can see here, here's our first prototype box, which is not as aesthetically pleasing as our second device, and then we also added a, a little like cut in half rubber noodle, so then we could place on the dog's head and it would be soft and it would not be like uh, harmful to the dog. For the first test that we conducted on the dog, we conducted a safety test, which really measures like if our product actually works. So we tested it on Lucy, the dog, and myself, and both um, tests turned out to be really good as both of us stopped when, or like changed directions when like we started hearing the beeping go off, like when we were walking towards an object or a wall or whatever it was. And, yeah. Then for our second test, we tested how the dog interacted with the device, and we thought that um, we would see how long it would take normally to put the device on the dog's head, and we thought a fail would be if, um, if it took more than 60 seconds to put the device on the dog's head, or uh, the dog just shook off the, the, the device right after we put it on her. And so we, uh, the first couple times, Lucy didn't like enjoy it, but then she got used to it, and then she wouldn't like shake it like instantly, right after we would put the device on her head. And so we said yes that this did this test did pass because it took less than 60 seconds to put the device on the dog, and also it um, uh, she didn't shake it off instantly, but after a little while she would eventually shake the device off her head. And for our final test, we did a pill and look test. We went around and got 18 responses from other people. And the average answer was a 3.06, which is basically that the device doesn't look bad, but it doesn't look great. So it's like somewhere in the middle. And then um, with that, like, we, we need improvements on it, like the uh, appearance. But other than that, it's pretty good. And then some of our acknowledgements are obviously Mr. Walker for being our teacher of the whole year, and our mentor, Mr. McCrudden, with all the programming and finding materials, and of course Lucy, who is our third partner in crime. She, uh, she was fine with all the tests, so we thank her a lot, and everyone who obviously responded to our surveys, and Ms. Selva for answering all of our questions. And to summarize what we did, we created a, a little contraption box type house um, with a device in it that um, it has an ultrasonic sensor in it that senses how close an object is and when it gets into a certain range it will start going beeping and it lets you know like if there's an object near so you can stop or turn around or whatever. And then for the future um, we are thinking that like obviously we need more changes on it like we have to make it a little bit smaller and probably make it like 
like extra sizes and whatever, but other than that, it could possibly go in the market. And we can take questions now if that's all right. Okay, sir. Sure. What, to that last point that you just made, what other materials have you thought about? Is it one size fit all? Is, did you give any consideration to the type of material used around the strap in terms of skin irritation, comfort level for the dog, anything like that? Like the Velcro, like around it? Um, I, I, so like the only materials that we were like, had access to was just the Velcro basically. And like for future considerations, we would definitely like change that up. What about the for the actual box itself? Uh, we had like a little foam piece like going top of the head, like in between the box and the head. So, are you asking about like the size or the material, like instead of three D printing material? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, do you want to answer that, or do you want me to? Okay. okay. Uh, we obviously thought of different. Um, materials that we would use, but I guess uh, 3D printing was the most uh, at hand because we just made the CAD design and then um, we'd have the device there instead of having to like mold it out of a different material, I guess. And also, um, uh, uh, we also thought of like the material Crocs are made out of. Um, to put that instead, of, we used a, a, like half of a noodle cut in half underneath there because Croc materials are like squishy. And so I thought that'd be great padding, but we just didn't have the time to like have that shift and that sort of thing. So you're talking about padding underneath your box to the touch. Of yes. The yes. Of the okay. So you're looking for not only comfort but slip. Yes. What's the activation range? What makes it go off? And how did you how did you come up with that distance? Uh, for that distance, it was kind of like trial and error, and we just like like walked around like a house to just to see like how far an object would be away, like, if you're, like, in the middle of a room or something. And it's about, like, 70 centimeters, the range. Okay. How does the speed of the animal impact that distance? Like, if a dog is running versus walking in the house, would it work equally as well? What limitations did you find with the speed that the animal was traveling? If the dog is running, like, that would still work the same way. But usually, like, blind dogs aren't running, so we didn't really, like, encounter that problem. How did you determine the, uh, the frequency that you chose for the sound itself? Uh, for the frequency, it was, like, we just decided to, like, make a, like, high-pitched, kind of low-sounding uh, frequency, like, when I, we were programming it. So we just like play around with other frequencies and decide with that one. Like we thought that the frequency that we found was not like super alerting, like if it was going super fast, but I thought that it was pretty good because it's going like at a moderate pace and it's kind of just to notify like how far away the dog is without like scaring it while it's on the dog. Is the ultimate goal for the dog to wear it at all times or just like a training device that they could learn where objects are and ultimately remove it over time. I think our goal was to make it so dogs would wear it all the time except for like when they were sleeping obviously. But because it's hard for dogs to still like adapt to their environment like blind dogs. So I don't know if that answers I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. What was your power source? Maybe I missed that. Is it battery operated or Yes, it is. It's a three volt ba uh, battery. Rechargeable or yes. replaceable? Rechargeable. Okay. Just real quick, you may have mentioned this one as well, but how long was Lucy wearing it before you could tell that she was actually navigating on her own? Um, well, it took her a little while to get used to like the device actually on her head, but like once she started walking and then she heard the beat, like she would stop, but after a little while, she would get used to it, but then also after a little while, the device would eventually slip off because it wasn't like, like the Velcro wasn't like the best material we could have used to keep the device on the dog without hurting it. So we didn't want to like strap it super tight on her, so. Do you have that the front? Yes, yeah, her Velcro is in there, if you want me to. Yeah. You got it? Yeah. I think there was one more question. Have you looked into the patent 
process at all? Uh, we haven't yet, but we definitely have high hopes for this, uh, for our advice. I feel like we definitely have potential with making it something that can be on the market soon. Great. I think Carson right there is just putting the Velcro through like we would, and then how you just Velcro it and strap it through on the dog's head. It's just taped. Then we also have like a Velcro strap that goes in the back too, like next to the collar. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out. Guys, have like uh, like four minutes, Evan. You guys gotta go sit down. Also, I think just kind of running things here, Tyler. You gotta either sit down or. And then do they refer to it? Yeah. You gonna stay and watch some more?
Dr. H, did you get a second for your I did not. But here's my own. I like the exchange things. I've always told you. I'm going to go to the Thank you. I
Hello. Judges are ready, parents are ready, students are ready, mentors. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our capstone project. Uh, today, we'll be talking about gasoline drippage prevention. So, my name is Jack Love, and I've been attending Pine Lake since kindergarten. So, for the last 12 years, I've been part of this community, and uh, it's been a great experience. And in the fall, I plan on attending. University of North Carolina Wilmington and studying economics or some other business related major. My name is Evan Foley. I've been at Pine Lake since the eighth grade and in the fall I will be planning to attend Virginia Tech University with a major in general engineering with a focus on biomedical engineering. So this is our objectives we will cover. You can kind of think of it, of it as a table of contents. So some of the things we want to highlight throughout the presentation are some of the existing solutions we found, our problem statement, some of the design concepts and the CAD models that we created, the construction of our finalized prototype, some of the testing that we went through, uh, how much did it cost to make, and what, what did we find out, and some of the things that we would change, and what did we learn throughout this process. All right, so why did we choose this topic? What we're solving is the problem of, you know, when you go to a gas station and you take the the nozzle out of the tank, right? And it drips all over you. It gets on your skin, it gets on your clothes, maybe on your car. Um, it's, it's not only an inconvenience, it's a safety problem, it's bad for the environment. Even that little amount of gasoline can cause problems over the course of time. And uh, once again, exposure to gasoline over an extended period of time is not good for anything. It's not good for the environment. And we're solving a problem that is an everyday thing. So this is our problem statement. Just to start, so what is a problem statement? A problem statement is a statement that is going against a basic problem in which we are targeting a certain consumer which is backed with facts and data. So as you can see on the left by the highlighted, we are targeting consumers of gasoline. And with some facts, we have that 82% of gasoline related deaths are from the gasoline at gas stations. And we found that if we reduce the amount of gasoline drippage, we could reduce the amount of damage that is imposed on one skin, their clothes, and their vehicle too. All right, so back into why we're doing this project. You know, gasoline is, once again, it's not something you want to be exposed to for extended periods of time. It's, um, it's been linked to the formation of cancer and carcinogens. And although gasoline has become safer over the course of the years, uh, being now that it's unleaded instead of leaded, there are still trace amounts of lead found in gasoline which, um, you know, we're looking to limit the exposure to, obviously. Gasoline is flammable, it's toxic, it uh, causes irritation to skin and eyes when it comes in contact with those parts of the body. And anything we can do to limit exposure to the environment and to human contact will be beneficial. So this is our justifications and evidence page. So when we think of just justifications and evidence, we did some prior research before we knew anything about gasoline. And we looked at some articles in which we found out some different research and in different internal combustion engines and how they relate to the different types of gasoline that we'd be going into, as such as like some of the ICEs that we found, like this is a newer Toyota model right here, and this is an older one, and how do we relate to the different gasolines and the different gas flows. And we also found out that according to a test conducted by an author by the name of Michelle Roth, we found that um, when rats are exposed to these different hydrocarbons and greenhouse gases that the, the, in the rats' kidneys, that they actually develop tumors in which ends up killing them. As you can see right here, this is a rat-infused tumor right here in the kidney, and this is a normal one. And how it affects the epithelial tissue 
And we concluded that, according to the article, we found that the, the same effects can be caused in humans, too. All right, so we're going to look at some of our existing solutions here to start. This kind of gave us some inspiration, kind of gave us a better idea of where we wanted to go with our product, where we didn't want to go. So on the left here, we have something that was called just a gas nozzle valve. Pretty simple product. Um, it could be attached to existing nozzles. However, it didn't do the best job. Is what we found in our research. It uh, kind of disrupted the flow. And then on the right here, we had another product that we found called a fuel drip retainer. And it could also be retrofitted to any nozzle that existed already. However, it did not eliminate all the drippage. So it didn't necessarily improve what it was trying to improve. So on this slide, we can see um, actual existing solutions that have been patented. And on the left right here, we have a gasoline flow sensor. It's kind of like when you're at a gas station. And when you take out your gas nozzle from the gasoline tank, it does that little click, and it stops the gasoline flow. This is what this, uh, this is designed to do. And some of the pros is that it's very reliable, and there's very little malfunctions. And on the right, we have a kind of a basic like U-line latex glove. And these are like more of a one-time use thing. So some of the cons of this would be you throw it away, and it's not very environmentally friendly, which is what our product is designed to target, and that's why we believe our product is better than these two up here, is because we want it to be something that can have more than a one-time use and last at least five to six years, and be something that can target consumers that are more environmentally friendly, and for gas station companies to have something that they can rely on, besides just some basic gloves and a flow sensor. So these are some of my brainstorms. So on the left here, when I first started out, we thought, I was thinking more of targeting towards gas cans. And for the fuel nozzle, that's what I called it right here, um, I kind of was leaning towards a material like a steel, like titanium, or kind of like a polyethylene plastic. And with these little holes at the bottom, they were designed to like, just help the gasoline from the gas can or the fuel nozzle go through more smoothly and catch some of the excess gas in between each of these holes. And on the right is more of a basic funnel right here with some dimensions at the bottom and on the sides. And as you can see on the right, my intended goal was for it to screw on onto the gasoline, to like the tank on the nozzle right there. And I was hoping to make it out of like a friendly polyethylene, which is very environmentally friendly. And the goal was for when the gasoline tank would be put into, when it pulled out, the gasoline would be caught at the very top right here. All right, so now we're gonna look at some of the brainstorms that I had uh, come up with originally. On the left here, I had something that I called a fuel flap. And what it did was it was meant to uh, be a consumer product, which we later decided was not the route that we wanted to go. We later decided we wanted to market our product to large companies like Chevron and BP. Um, but this was designed to slip onto the end of the nozzle and it kind of formed a, a tight seal with rubber flaps that would be open during the process of filling the tank, however, shut off once there's no pressure applied and form a tight seal. And then on the right, we had something called the fuel sponge, which would sit on the inside of the fuel tank, and it would allow the passage of gasoline into the tank, but when the flow was done, it would um, act to absorb, kind of as a sponge, it would absorb the, uh, the remaining fuel that was coming out of the end. So these are some of our science and engineering concepts. So what is exhaust gasoline flow? It's kind of like the mass in the gasoline, the pressure from the pressure that is exerted from the fuel nozzle into the gasoline and how fast does it go? And some of the fluid and aerodynamics and the sensitivity of energy flow has to go back to the ICEs, the internal combustion engines, and how sensitive, because the newer models might be more sensitive to a certain type of gasoline, such as like the 87s and the 93s, whereas some of the older models might be more used to it and vice versa. So why are these important? These are important because we needed to figure out what type of gasoline should we target. So we chose to go towards the kind of like a basic gasoline, not towards diesel because we believe that diesel isn't really used for the basic consumer every day at the gas station. And we use this information to kind of go towards and find our target consumers and learn what type of gasoline nozzles we should work towards. So some more of the science and engineering concepts, as you can see on the bottom right right here, we have some composite materials. We did some research on these and figuring out that some of the silicones and plastics that we had on hand and some of the ones that we could purchase online 
we needed to do some research on how dense the materials were and how we could use them within our design on the fuel nozzles and how they would relate to each of them using our STEM principles. All right, so once again, materials that we considered. We, we looked at a wide variety of things. We um, originally, and the best option that we could have gone with would have been a stainless steel because we feel like this would have allowed precision and structural integrity. Um, you know, for laser milling, for very precise design, and steel is very strong and withstands the test of time very well. We also considered nitriles and rubbers to coat stuff. Um, but we ultimately ended up deciding on an ABS plastic that also allowed for precision and at the same time it allowed the product to withstand the test of chemicals. So now we're going to get into some more detailed research and we looked online for a variety of sources that we could use and one example we found was Mr. Steve Kushnick. He's a marketing expert who really helped us to develop our environmentally friendly approach because we felt that um, marketing this towards the large companies is going to be more successful than, than towards the individual consumers and that way it will kind of set a precedent. And uh, he also helped us to clarify information regarding regulations with petroleum rules, groups like OSHA, and impacts on the environment. So another expert that we contacted out of the two of the ten that we got a response from, his name was Mr. Robert Shaft. And he works for a large company called Chevron, and he was very helpful in our design because he told us about different materials that were more environmentally friendly, such as polyethylene, stainless steels, and he also brought to our attention that many of the materials that we had in mind were flammable, and that doesn't really work well at gas stations. So we, used, we were targeting more of like a plastic, something that would withstand the gasoline pressure and and the degradation of the gasoline after a long amount of time that we will get into uh, later with our testing protocols. And he really helped us with like developing this polyethylene right here, which is something we would have probably used if we had more time on this project and more resources. And he helped us with like this material support and some moral support too, and encouraging us to move forth with um, the ideas that we had so far. All right, so now we're going to get into some more detailed mentor content. Uh, our mentor, Michael Ishii, he's actually sitting in the audience right now. We'd like to thank him for everything along the way. He helped us with feedback on all of our designs. He uh, really provided great support the entire time and provided us with lots of useful links, information, websites regarding materials that we can use and uh, really just provided a great viewpoint from the consumer standpoint and helped us to critique our design. So right here we have our project plan and our budget. So on the left right here we have the design specifications. So what are design specifications? They are things that we need to follow and kind of lay out before we even started making any like prototypes and some of the things we highlight right here is the target cost. So many of the gasoline products right now are very expensive and we wanted our product to be less expensive for the companies that can end up making a profit off of it. And some, another one I want to highlight is, what should we be able to do? So, kind of our goal is we want this product to be able to eliminate that little, that little last bit of drippage at the very end of the gasoline after you pull it out of the tank. And on the right right here, we have some design constraints. So, a design constraint is something that we must, like, rules you have to follow if you want to think of it that way. And so we had to follow some dates set by Mr. Walker to meet these deadlines and make sure we, our products were well done and all the constraints were met, and we had to follow guidelines of the EPA and WHO, which were brought to our attention by um, Mr. Robert Shaft, and we had the gasoline product must be able to fit into a nozzle after we found out that uh, the average gasoline nozzle is about 0.85 inches in diameter, and we used that with a degree of accuracy of 0.2 inches on either side. All right, so now we're gonna get, get into some of our original CAD designs right here. This is actually a two-piece design. It's uh, slightly hard to tell that, but it's an outer ring. It's kind of like, think of it like a wedding ring, a very thin plastic ring. And then on the inside, we tried to CAD the mesh, which did not turn out so well. It, um, the resolution of the printer with the material that we were using did not turn out in a way that would allow the flow of gasoline to be uninterrupted. 
uh, the application of this product would have significantly slowed down the, the flow rate of the fuel and not necessarily helped us to what we wanted to achieve. And so then here, this was our next attempt and luckily it was our successful attempt at our product. Um, we have two halves here, one half slightly larger than the other uh, so that they can interlock properly. And in between these two pieces that we call the housing of the fuel grate, uh, we had a steel mesh and that was what allowed the fuel to be caught and slowed down and stop from dripping into, um, you know, your hands onto the car and onto the next. So on the left here again, that was our first attempt at the cab model. As you can see, that would be very difficult for uh, fuel to flow through there. There's not much space at all. Did not turn out the way we wanted. And then on the right here, we have our second product yet to be assembled. However, those are the two halves, which you would put the mesh in between and interlock. So this is our construction prototype right here. So step one in our construction prototype is making the framework. So we used a 3D printer actually out there in the STEM lobby, and we created this framework from the ABS plastic as Jack stated before, using the correct dimensions that we found out with, as I stated before, the 0.85 inches with a degree of accuracy of 0.2 inches on either side. So moving into step two right here, as you can see, this is our steel mesh that we chose to use right here with uh, the housing and framework on the bottom. And just a, a small step, it's cutting out a small square after we sprayed it with Flex Seal. And so why do we use Flex Seal? We use Flex Seal because um, we thought that since Flex Seal is, uh, has the polarity, or the polarity of water is attracted towards the Flex Seal, we assumed that the gasoline would also be, with the polarity of gasoline, be closely associated to be attracted to the Flex Seal. So step three in our process, which is kind of like an optional step, but we think it's very beneficial, is poking some holes into the flex steel steel mesh, and so it will fit tightly onto the pegs of the framing and the housework. And moving on over here to step four, we have it, if you choose to skip step three, you can just glue on to with a very water resistant glue, like a gasoline resistant glue that would help hold the framework together and hold the steel mesh within each of the uh, frameworks on either side. So moving on to step five, which is kind of a, a basic step, it's just cutting around the edges and making sure none of that steel wool, or not steel wool, steel mesh is around on the outside and making sure none of the, it's a very sharp product and it can really injure some of the consumers that we were targeting and that's, we don't want that. And we want to make sure that none of the steel mesh is, can get stuck within each of the gasoline nozzles. And step six is just putting it inside the, into the gasoline nozzle. This is our little gasoline nozzle that we bought offline. It's actually right down here in the front. And we think it's like, it's very close to an actual gasoline nozzle. Not the exact dimensions, but it's very close enough where we could use testing protocols to find out how this product will work with um, water and gasoline solutions. All right, so that's gonna bring us into our first and perhaps most, um, one of the most important testing protocols is our time and efficiency test. So we don't want to be creating a product that's going to have the consumer be at the gas station longer than they want to. Um, and as seen here, the application of no product whatsoever, it took one minute and 12 seconds to fill up a five gallon bucket with water and a garden hose. That's how we simulated the process of filling a gas tank. It took one minute and 12 seconds and the longest time was only a 10 second difference with one minute and 22 seconds. So we did not find that to be a statistically large enough difference to say that it altered the time it took to fill a, uh, a gas tank. We found an average flow rate of one gallon every 15.1 seconds or 3.9 gallons per minute. That remained pretty constant across the different variations of our product. And so here are some pictures from our first testing protocol. We did not gather any videos from this stage uh, due to the fact that one of us was filling the bucket and the other was timing. Um, but yeah, and then we'll get into our uh, second test. Yeah, the drippage test. So we really consider this one of our most important tests because our product is targeted towards limiting the amount of drippage after it comes out of the fuel nozzle. So what is the purpose? The purpose of this is to find out if we were to use no product on this gasoline nozzle and products with one screen of steel mesh or two screens with steel mesh and how would this work with our flex seal as we'll see shown in the data chart on the next slide. And we'll measure these results by, count, by counting the number of drips that came off after we 
the fuel nozzle hit the water and the automatic stopper went off and the drips that came off using each of our products that were applied. Okay, so right here is the drippage seen with no screens, no product applied whatsoever. As seen in that, there is a significant amount of drippage that would represent the fuel uh, coming out at the end. That's gasoline that you don't want to get on yourself. You don't want to spill it everywhere. You want it in your tank. You want it in your tank, not not on the ground. All right. So then, here is the application of what we determined to be our best solution: two screens of steel mesh with no paint on it. that that was a, a large difference. There was um, very little fuel that came out there. And so we're going to move on to why, once again, that was our best solution. And into our next test, the degradation test. So our degradation test was a test to test, as we put it, our completed prototype into a beaker, as you can see right here, kind of simulated with the gasoline right here on the top, we put it into the gasoline for about three days or so to see how the the product would last and see if it would have a sustainability and the steel mesh, it was just, just to see if it would dissolve within the gasoline to make sure it could withstand enough gasoline after a certain amount of days as it would as we are as our goal was to make sure it would last five to six years within a gasoline tank. Okay, so here's some results from that test. Uh, we did not see any structural integrity compromise during the degradation test. All of our products remained intact and functioning well as we ran tests again with the same products after they had sat in the chemicals. So some of the analysis of our testing protocols is what did we take away? We took away that we found that the flex seal was very, um, it, it didn't work well with the gasoline and it would keep on, it fell off and dissolved after three days of, it, at, according to the degradation test and the gasoline kind of dissolved it and we found that the drippage and the fuel time efficiency test, they had different results with, um, they would have different results with gasoline as we couldn't test it at an actual gas station. So we used the water to, with the different polarities as I talked about before, to, to get very similar results. All right, here's our cost analysis. Just a quick overview of some of our product and material costs. And some of the problems that we encountered along the way, we, um, our biggest problem was obviously with the CAD, figuring out the proper solution. However, we also encountered some problems with our adhesive and in the future, determining which adhesive we would like to use instead as this. Perhaps it didn't compromise the structural integrity. However, it did cause a change in appearance. It somewhat flaked. However, it did not affect the performance of the product. So just a conclusion of our results, just to wrap it up. So we did find out that gasoline is a very delicate product, especially when you, use, when you work with it in everyday life. And we wanted to make sure that we get that last little bit of drippage out to prevent environmental impacts and self-harm impacts of gasoline on one's body, clothes, and consumer products. Okay, so next time, things that we do different, maybe market this to a, uh, a diesel market as well. Maybe attempt testing with real gasoline and perhaps field a better range of uh, customer input to see what do the consumers want, what do they want changed. So what did we learn? We learned how to use a 3D printer as this is one of the STEM 3D printers that we use and we learned the value of teamwork and communication and making sure our products and we were always on the same page because it's kind of hard when one of us has a different idea and the other one has another one. Where do we meet in the middle? So that's we learned that value as it'll take us through the course of life in general, making sure that we have great teamwork and communication, especially when you get a job when you're older, having great teamwork and communication, make sure that you every the boat runs smoothly. All right, so once again, we'd like to thank everybody for helping us along the way. We couldn't have done it without everyone. First and foremost, Mr. Walker for being a great teacher, excellent mentor and orchestrator. Uh, he helped us for not only this year, but for the course of high school. 
And thanks to Mr. Ishii for being a supportive mentor. He provided us with some great insight and excellent feedback. And thanks to students such as Colin Shannon and Reggie Sidbury, they helped us test our product, and Christian Zimmick as well, who is not a STEM student. However, he helped us to CAD some early prototypes of our product. And we couldn't have done this without everyone, so thank you for everyone and your contributions. I'll now take questions. So our specification is for what should it be able to do. Our goal was to find out that there was very little to none drippers that we would use using our product that we created. And we wanted to make sure that it would not get on your hands, your clothes, or your car, and be more environmentally friendly. And from the hydrocarbons and the greenhouse gases that would become out in the mid, so our product would eliminate that. So that was two criteria? Those were not our um, necessarily only criteria for are, are you asking um if those were like our only two yeah what was your what was the criteria used to, to determine what the best solution would be well with our testing protocols we we looked at several different variations of our products and tested them against time drippage and corrosion or, and degradation so those were kind of the criteria that we used in order to determine which version of our product was the best Whichever, whichever version of our product uh, scored best on all three of those tests is what we went with. I'm sorry, is that after testing or that was your brainstorm? Looking at your brainstorm ideas or you tested your, you tested your product against those four criteria? Well, we can have the brainstorms. Our, kind of our criteria for that was making sure that it would fit into the, like, the gasoline nozzle and making sure it would like, be environmentally friendly. But after we conducted our testing protocols, after we created a, pr a prototype that we best believe would best suit the needs of the consumer, we used these uh, design specifications for, I guess, throughout the entire process. And going back to like our problem statement, we talked about like a target consumer and the target cost and things that we needed to meet in order to have a good product. Is it reasonable to say that the gasoline is just sitting on the inside right there and it's that's being held? Is that? Uh, yes, that's, that's kind of the, that's the main goal, I guess, is the screen is designed to kind of act as a barrier once, because once there's no flow, it um, doesn't have enough power to find its way through the small holes in the, in the mesh. It's kind of like an adhesive property, you know, how water, will stick to screens, it'll stick to, you know, through capillary action, it will be attracted to other surfaces if it doesn't have that specific uh, energy and space to find its way through. I was going to ask, just in terms of, what, what would you expect to fly? Two parts to the question. One is, would you do another experiment reviewing it out of the three days of adequate amount of time in terms of your testing for uh, kind of shelf life, if you will? And then second, the octane, you had mentioned at one point out that the octane, you had um, looked at, I think you said 87. So if you went up to 93 or to diesel, what would you be expecting the results to be? Can you extrapolate that out or not? Yeah, so if we were to have like more time, I guess, throughout the year, if we would use um, a longer test, I guess like 
more like a year or five years to see how this product would work and kind of like using like a testing, another testing protocol at a gas station and we would expect that the 93 gasoline, the one that we worked with, was a closer to an 87 so we would think the 93 would have a different result. We're not sure what that result would be but we'd have to run testing protocols and design more specifications for that testing protocol to make sure that if it did have a different result, we would have to adjust our product according to those results. And what about diesel? Would you expect it to be more challenging? Yeah, we would expect it to be more challenging with the diesel because the diesel has a different density. It's not the same as gasoline. So we would have to design the, the steel mesh and the other parts of the framework and make sure and do more research on how diesel affects um, the, the ABS plastic that we use our framework out of.
Technical difficulties. <laughs> Hello. I'm going to introduce my son-in-law, Paul Ebenhoe. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our project. My name is Thomas Caffey. I'm a current senior here at Pine Link, and I've been here since third grade. I plan on attending UNC Charlotte uh, to study finance. Hello, my name is Spencer K. Um, I've been at Pine Lake since I'm in kindergarten. Uh, and I've been at, I'm a senior this year. And then after high school, I plan to attend Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. And this is our project, Door Ding Dilemma. And so, really, going into our project, our goal is to create a solution. Obviously, problems require solutions. According to the U.S. Department of Vehicle Registrations, there are currently 285 million registered vehicles in the United States alone. And that really puts into perspective just how many parking lots there are in our cities today. And with that comes crowds and accidents are bound to follow. And this is why we aim to create a solution. Uh, our reasons why? Uh, to save money. Door dings can cost uh, on average $150 for repairs. Um, and it also takes tons of time to go through insurance claims and then everything else to get this money and then eventually repair them. Um, we also wanted to combine function with style. A lot of the recent products that are out there now uh, don't even look the greatest. Um, they are, could be expensive also. Um, so we're going to combine function to protect our doors uh, with also a cool style. Uh, our problem statement, uh, our goal is to aim towards sedan owners. Um, this is probably one of the most common cars in America today, uh, which is why we chose sedans. Uh, and mostly you use this product in tight parking spots like in a busy uh, garage um, or even parking lots uh, for uh, the latest retail stores. Right, so justifying our project. Time. So in the event of an accident or door ding, it just takes weeks, even months, you have to find a body shop, someone who's willing to fix your car for you. And that can just take precious time out of your day. Not only that is costly, as Spencer said, the average cost we found, according to WBTV, the average repair cost for a door ding ranges from, in the low end, $150, up to $800, $900. And that equates to nearly $2.1 billion yearly that car owners have spent in the 2018 and 19 years on door dings alone. And it's just overall confusing. You know, filing police reports, checking security cameras, getting these insurance claims. It's really confusing, and we aim to reduce that, of course. And so we really want to dive deeper into this, especially in the local community, uh, what people thought. And we asked students at Pine Lake, you know, had they ever been in a door ding? You know, what was their experience? And everyone we answered has been, over 60%, has been in at least one door ding at one time in their life. 
with the overwhelming majority being in parking lots and a small percentage as well having five plus door dings. And so it's a common problem in America today. Uh, some current products uh, involving the situation. This was the first one I looked at, um, which this one uh, was a pretty easy install and had a good protection because it was very uh, big and wide. It was covered a majority of the door, um, which was good. But then some of the cons, uh, this product takes time to install. Uh, you have to like roll it and put it onto the car. And you can't open the doors with it on. Um, so if you just want to open your back door or passenger side door for something really quick, you have to take the whole product off, uh, which is just a lot of time. And it also didn't look that great, just having this big black huge thing and then that green cable uh, coming out of the door. And it was also very expensive. It cost upwards of $80 uh, just for this product. And then one other current uh, product was this one. Uh, this one was cheaper, but it only covers one door, uh, which was definitely a con. Because um, if you had a four-door car, uh, like sedans most today, uh, you'd have to buy four of them. Um, this one could also be stolen easily because it was only held on by the suction cup. So someone could just come and take it, and then you wouldn't even know if you were in the store. Right, and so going deeper into that, our research, uh, we tried to find various concepts and laws related to our problem. And it's a little on the difficult side in terms of legality. There's no direct laws or statutes related to door dings and things of the sort, but we just found some about you know the use of car doors, and so we kind of use that to our advantage, and that our product you know, we don't want that to hinder the function of a car door, whether stationary or even if you, you know, forgot it, you're driving along the road. And various science concepts as well. I'm not a physics student, but Spencer is. And so we found, uh, through the help of our teacher, Mr. Walker, uh, a new concept that we had to look into, coefficient of restitution. It basically explains it right here. Uh, what happens after a collision? And just, you know, kind of a subsidy of that, force uh, because you know studying the impacts and the effect they can have on our product is really important so diving deeper into that was very important as well and we tried to accumulate a list of expert knowledge here are some uh, mechanics and auto body repairmen in our local area we tried our best to reach out to them and we got some knowledge on door dings uh, and just their experience with it, and just, you know, they told us how common it is. Uh, but our main help here uh, is Mr. Evans, our mentor, uh, is right in the audience. Uh, we really thank him for his help, because uh, he's really good with the design process. He helped us critique our product, and especially on diving deeper into, you know, the physics side of things. Uh, a few, these are the two patents we found uh, related to our product. Uh, as you can see, the first one on the left here was most like uh, that first product I showed you uh, with the magnetic strip that goes along the car. Um, and then this next one, uh, this thicker piece right here would be almost the foam. And then that back piece uh, would be the magnetic strip that goes on the car. And so we definitely took these ideas into hand and kind of combined the two, uh, which got us to our product. Uh, and that leads us into brainstorming. Right, and uh, just going to brainstorming, we just, this was very in the beginning of the year, and so I had a very base level idea, and it's kind of just a, you know, very base level drawing. This is my interpretation of it. There would kind of be foam pads on the edge that would kind of act like as a barrier, and um, kind of like one of the patents, you know, this could be put through two separate pieces on the door uh, to allow for uh, a wider range of use, but I didn't really have any knowledge prior, so I tried my best to formulate a brainstorm. Uh, my brainstorm was most like the one that we went with. Um, so this long piece right here uh, was foam, and then this little rectangle right here was a uh, piece of, we didn't have the material determined yet, but it was a piece of something that would go into your door jam, and you shut the door on it, and that would hold your product there. Um, this was a very base design, and we hadn't really thought a lot of it other than that was what would hold it, and then this foam uh, would hold the door and protect it. And then this was our final CAD. Um, we originally went with my design, and so we have the long foam piece right here, and then we have the piece that would go into the door, and uh, you close that on it, and that would hold it. Um, we originally didn't think this rubber piece would uh, hold the product and be very sturdy, 
So we added these supports, uh, which we later saw that uh, you, if you couldn't shut the door on that, and that got in the way of it. Um, so we thought of a solution later on in the presentation. Right, so getting analytical about the budget, you know, really diving deeper into what we can use for our final product. And we're very fortunate to have a lot of things available in the STEM building. So we really uh, only had to purchase two things. And uh, first, uh, we used Flex Seal water sealant spray. Uh, I know it's the most famous product, you know, for rubber sealants out there, and you know, I was very quick to purchase that, and it worked very well. As well as Gorilla Glue, a very famous uh, super glue product. Uh, very, it's basically the foundation of our product, you know, keeping these things intact together as well. And for the back form, foam piece, which can be seen in a second, uh, we basically, in the lab, found a vinyl acetate uh, support board. It's basically those foam puzzle pieces that you see in like uh, elementary classrooms. And so we're able to have that and use that for our lining, uh, not only for physical, but functional support as well. And for the back insert piece, uh, there's a rubber strip available in the lab as well. And so we're able to cut that for our specification and it works very well. In terms of our materials, uh, construction materials. We were very uh, fortunate to have these things on hand as well. Uh, we had a box cutter, just simple tools for cutting out and constructing. Uh, Mr. Walker was able to lend us the laser cutter in the lobby of the STEM building, uh, which made for very precise, uh, you know, just outline construction. that came out very uh, precise in our final product. And we were able to use a bandsaw as well, uh, which made the slab much cleaner, much neater uh, in the end. Uh, with construction, we began by cutting the pool noodle in half. Um, and then our next step was cutting the foam board uh, strips. And so we measured the diameter of the pool noodle. And then uh, we just cut down that diameter down the uh, foam board. And we cut two of those, which was about four feet long, which is our original dimension. Um, and then you can see here in the right, we were gluing the puzzle pieces together. The puzzle pieces worked well because we were able to do it like a puzzle, which provided much more support to the product uh, and more surface area that the glue would hold it together. Uh, next to the construction, this black border right here uh, was not in our original CAD. Um, we ended up determining that this was needed for more support uh, and it made the product a lot sturdier. This is what the rubber piece will go on and with this being bigger than what we designed, it allowed us to do a much bigger piece of rubber, uh, which provided more contact with the door. Um, on the right here, this is us spraying our pool noodle with Flex Seal. Uh, the Flex Seal was really just there to provide and make sure that no water would get in because we wanted this product to be used in rain, uh, snow, and whatever weather conditions you had. Right, uh, so before we even did that, we had a first little jab at it. Um, right here, we used cardboard available just around the STEM building and uh, we tried our best to configure it and actually worked very well uh, installing just on a normal car door. Uh, our video is unable to show because of technical difficulties, but it's basically us installing it uh, and that's the result. And it worked very well for first attempts and it was just from there on modifying it and nailing down the specifics. And after that, we are able to come to a final product that looks much cleaner much neater, much more functional with the materials and just overall uh, aspects, uh, visually and functionally. And here is an installation video uh, that it would be shown. space, him you know, reaching out of his trunk like a rural scenario, and just how easy and viable it is to install in a real world scenario. And right here it is going to simulate an impact, you know, if someone was really close and they had to open their door to hit the car. Go ahead. As you can see it deflected the, the impact from the door 
uh, preventing any further damage to a car um, doing its job. And so we also completed three various tests once we got down our product. And one of them, going back to the concepts, was restitution and how various amounts of forces uh, upon our product would affect its durability. And so we had a hatchback and a sedan, and it did very well in two various uh, lighter forces, but once we got to really uh, over 200 newtons, uh, we saw some slight abrasions and damages to the product, little dents in the flex seal, um, and so we're able to assess that and modify it as need be. Uh, next, we have the environmental test. Uh, like I said, I wanted the product to work in all weather conditions. Um, so first, we put the uh, product, I made like a little uh, mock-up. It was just a piece of foam and a little piece of the foam board that was glued together with flex seal on it, because um, our full product would not fit in a freezer or the oven incubator, which we used. Um, but we took that and we put it in an oven incubator for four hours and I checked on it each hour. Um, and there's no signs of the glue coming apart or the flex seal uh, tearing away from the product. Uh, the product still worked just as well. Um, the only thing we noticed was the product was, it got softer in the heat, um, but it did not take away the uh, performance of the uh, device itself. Uh, next we did the cold environmental test. Uh, we just stuck it in the freezer for four hours. Um, and this is the opposite of the heat. Uh, the, the little thing actually got uh, harder. Um, again, did not take away any function of it. And then next we have a video of it in water uh, to show how well the water sealant worked. Test. We're very proud with the results uh, on the flex seal. Yeah, as you can see, the water just beads right off, uh, allowing no rain, and that shows that no rain, if the rain was hit, it would just fall right off. And we wanted to test out, again, you know, just how realistic this product was, and so we asked uh, some students around uh, Pine Lake, and uh, we simulated, we, went, we used their car, and they put it in their trunk, and we timed them on their installation, you know, without any prior knowledge of the product, uh, we timed them, and uh, we just got their feedback and we were able to see that everyone was well within their ability to do it, uh, installed within 30 seconds and the average approval of installation and how protective the product was, was around uh, an 8. Uh, so we got very good approval ratings as well as some criticisms on, you know, our design just in general. So we're very proud of that. And really what we discovered from the test is that the Flex Seal is not perfect. Right here, there's some cracking and just overall dryness of the product. You know, when we first sprayed this, I mean, we took our uh, first attempt at it, we let it dry out in the sun. Yeah, you know, we didn't really figure out, uh, think about, you know, the various environments. Um, we just kind of put it out in the sun, did it one coat only, and it caused some abrasions. And, you know, when we did the restitution test, uh, it ended up with uh, more uh, vulnerability to damage. So we really took this into consideration when considering uh, modifications for our final. Uh, some of the skills we learned was the design process. Going into this project, uh, I thought some of the design process things were just kind of unnecessary in the steps we were taking. Um, but I soon later realized that they were very much necessary and they helped us in the long run. Um, Mr. Evans especially helped with that. Uh, he showed us how he uses that in a real day, uh, like at his job. Um, and so we learned more about that. We also had to adapt to some situations. Uh, the rubber piece we had was very uh, bent, and we noticed that when you put it up to the door, uh, the curvedness of it made it not as easy to install. Um, so Mr. Walker helped us flatten it with heat and weights. Uh, we also learned more about data collection um, and how we took these results and benefited to our use um, and took their advice. We also learned more about material properties as we looked into different materials to use and the different densities and how that affects the coefficient of restitution for different products. Uh, what we changed, um, as you can see, the, the Gorilla Glue that we had uh, became very foam-like, uh, and we did not like how this looked on the product. It just didn't look very clean. Um, so at the end, we switched to Super Glue for our final product. And then another thing we changed was, like I talked about, this big board and then the bigger piece of rubber. 
and, and uh, before the agonizer, you can just come down here and show you the actual product. Uh, it looks much better, um, especially with the difference. Uh, if you go back to that, um, much cleaner, much more efficient in terms of design, and just overall visual appeal. And so modifying our product, we really wanted to make sure the flex seal was not dry, was not crackable, and we figured out that if we did it in a shady area, not on concrete, and applied two to three coats, that it was able to come out much cleaner looking and be less vulnerable to cracks. And really what we do differently is uh, we would try to test different types of water sealants. Obviously there are various different companies out there on the market uh, just flex seal, I know, is the uh, comes to mind. Uh, so we really want to jump on that. It worked very well, but we really want to expand uh, to see what else could work because uh, there's not the only one out there. And we wanted to collect more data on how the product works. If we had uh, more time, resources, maybe you know, at stores asking, you know, different people or different types of tests on the product. Um, obviously, the three tests we did were very uh, good, but just maybe expanding our parameters on those tests, we would have uh, considered uh, had we had the time. And really, our building our final product, we wish we could have done it more efficiently at times. You know, we taking our first jab at it uh, using the box cutters. We didn't originally even consider the laser cutter. You know, if you're able to do it in a much more professional matter, then uh, that's something we'll definitely take in consideration uh, if we were able to have more time and just improving on the skills that we found out the year. Uh, our acknowledgments, we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Walker, our teacher, for helping us throughout this process, um, especially with different things that we needed insight on. And then also we'd like to thank Mr. Evans, our mentor. Uh, he provided good insight on the equations to determine forces that uh, the foam could take um, and many other things. And then we'd also like to thank a few of our testers. Uh, they did a good job supporting us throughout uh, and helping us. Uh, any questions? Yes. How did you decide how long you wanted to make your uh, prototype? Uh, we really went off current solutions uh, on the marketplace, uh, especially on Amazon, and maybe if you want to, to go back to the current solutions. Um, I know those are mainly a different type of solution, but um, that and the patents uh, combined with we really narrowed down, uh, especially because we did sedans, we measured the average size of a sedan door. And we narrowed down from there, um, just kind of combining the two as best we could. Are you trying to solve, I'm in a parking lot and the car next to me opens up into my door? Because you kind of mentioned collisions and you mentioned like laser down, what one specific thing does this product solve? Uh, yes, sir, we're uh, fixing door dings, so that if someone's just going to open the door and hit you. Okay, and then I want to, you said that whenever you had your students practice, they gave you various criticisms. Can you elaborate on that? Because you just said they gave you criticisms. What did you learn from those conversations with those students? Right, so using their cars uh, in the parking spaces that they had, you know, it was more realistic. And you know, we're very uh, happy with our feedback, you know, with our average uh, positivity rating being an 8 out of 10. Uh, some people said the size could have been bigger. Uh, the installation could have been better uh, because people were doing this for the first time. They're thinking uh, the comments were able to be shown because of the screen size, but they're saying, once I figured it out, it was much better. You know? And so just kind of looking at it, you're kind of confused. And I wasn't able to take videos of people installing it, but they were kind of fumbling with the product for a tad bit, you know, wondering which way it went in the door and things like that. And um, again, some people were confused with the size, uh, the university, the universal use of it. Uh, they're wondering, you know, could it be bigger, you know, for trucks or Jeeps, you know, things like that. Excellent, thank you. I'm sorry, can you go back to your design concepts and parameters?
I think that's our slides for our design concepts. Okay. We have a lot of specifications. Uh, I do not believe so, we do. Um, well, when we put it into the car door, we did various things like pulling and tugging on it um, to see if it had any effect on the rubber. Um, and we tested it on probably 15 to 20 different cars, um, and there was no signs that the rubber was pulling apart or coming away from the foam itself. If you can see, if you want to see the product, uh, it's right here. I can bring it to you if you'd like, or you should. If you'd like to. Okay. Yeah, the door was able to close and lock with it in there, um, so that no one can open the door and then take the device out. Could you pull it out if you really need your car on it? No, you cannot. The rubber piece, the rubber slit right there, was you know really good at doing its job uh, because uh, within the door jams, it was small enough to be able to be secure once we locked in. And um, if you'd like, we could replay the demonstration video. But in the demonstration video. Um, he put it against one of the door pillars, and when he closed it, that created the, uh, I guess, the impact on the, the rubber slit, uh, keeping it in place. All right, we're out of time. Thank you, guys.
Golf is a very challenging sport, and it, but it's also a very popular one. One of the most challenging aspects is managing your equipment. We decided to focus on golf clubs. I'm Declan Ravy. And I'm Mason Ben. And our goal this year was to make a product that would keep golfers' hands from slipping when playing around the golf. So that's why we came up with the Duraglove. We decided to focus on golf slippage. And we see a lot of golf slippage in the spring and summer seasons when there's more rain and it's warmer outside. We decided we wanted to limit as much as possible how to limit, oh God, how to stop golf slippage. We decided to focus on performance. And we also are deeply interested in this because we want, we have been golfing for as long as we can remember and it's very important to us. We, so, our target audience was obviously golfers, and more specifically that was about 24 million because that's the amount of people that claim that they lose grip when their hands get sweaty or when they're playing in wet conditions, which obviously causes errant shots that go right, left, anywhere, which is obviously what you don't want in golf. So we wanted to come up with a solution that would combat this problem of having errant shots in wet conditions. This is our research and justification. So obviously we had to justify our project and make sure it was a problem worth solving. So we had to do a lot of research during this process, and a lot of which we did on our own. So we actually went out and asked everyday people if they play golf, what they tend to see in their equipment, and just any tent trend that they see that happens with their equipment. And you can see here that about 70% of them did say that they when they play, their grips do get wet, either from obviously playing in the rain or just from sweaty hands. And then about 59% of them said that their apparel does get wet and it does actually mess with their swing, which is probably because it sticks to their body and actually restricts their movement of their swing, which would probably cause, obviously, errant shots, which is what you don't want. And then last, they said that their glove, 35% of them said that their glove does not last as long as they want, want it to which is obviously a big hit because if you're paying all this money, you obviously want it to last to your liking. So after justifying our project, we had to go look at our existing solutions, and we found one that was most closely related to our project, which was the FootJoy Rain Glove. And the FootJoy Rain Glove actually has a cool concept to it. So obviously, since it's a rain glove, you're going to be using it when it's raining. And when you're playing in the rain, you want to have as much grip as you can. And this, grip, this glove actually gets more gains more grip as it gets more wet so later in the round when you're getting tired and everything all the conditions are getting worse it actually helps you have better shots it does uh, last longer than your typical cabretta leather white glove and it is more flexible than that same normal glove so that actually will help you retain or give you more comfort since it's more flexible you'll be able to move your hand around more uh, but everything in this world obviously comes at a cost, and this cost comes in at $22. And if you look at the market range of golf gloves, usually it falls in between the 10 to 15 range. So this glove obviously is way above that range. Uh, and it is all, this glove is also very ineffective when playing in dry conditions. So if you're playing that much money, you obviously want to be have a glove that is well or performs well in wet and dry conditions. So after looking at the existing solutions, we went into the brainstorming phase. And we had many, a wide variety of solutions that we came up with, from towels to substances that you put in your hands and or grips. But we actually ended up going with a golf glove. And as you can see on the left, this is a replaceable pad.
the phone back on. Hopefully, I don't know if you guys have a family member watching. The iPad's at 10%, so okay. hopefully it makes it. Come on up. So this is our presentation on the fishing arm sleeve. So my name is Sam Nottestead. I am a baseball player at Pine Lake. I have been here since kindergarten, so I was actually here in the initial opening of the campus. And I'm an avid fisherman. I go fishing quite a bit on the weekends. And I really enjoy it as a hobby just with my dad. Hi, my name is Jackson Denny. And I, uh, I went to Pine Lake my junior year. I was at Huff my freshman and sophomore year. And I play football since junior year, and I'm also an average fisherman. I go about once or twice a year. So, so we would like to ask: uh, Have you ever been fishing and experienced just a long loss of time, just been digging around in your tackle box a lot, just looking for a lure? Um, that is the goal of our project. Uh, we created the fishing arm sleeve just to make fishing a lot more easier and just make it much more of a fun experience for everyone. All right, and uh, the fishing arm sleeve is equipped with a two inch by four inch tackle box as well as a patch that is equipped with magnets. I'll come down to show that. This 
as you see right there. And then the magnets in the patch will also allow like almost any metal to be able to withstand any falls or whatever. And uh, the sleeve itself is made of a sweat-proof material, and it's also very flexible, so anyone can wear it, and it's very comfortable. So why did we choose our project? Um, when we initially started brainstorming for the project, me and Jackson, we came to kind of the common thing that we both really loved fishing. And we also came to the common problem that we oftentimes spend a lot of time just digging through our tackle box looking for a lure after we've lost one. So that's really where the idea of the project came up. And we really just wanted to make fishing way more easier for a beginner um, who's just getting into fishing. And this is for our research problem statement. We said, fly fishing has been a top hobby for many people for over hundreds of years. And as today, around 4.5 million people fly fish. Fly fishing is an activity done all over the world, and for many people to this day, it's a way of survival. But throughout the years, every fly fisherman has experienced a common problem. Fly fishermen need to move spots throughout their time fishing, and it's hard to do so when you have a large tackle box and want to move spots throughout their time. Oh, sorry, and want to change twice. Tackle boxes, especially if you have a large one, can be tough to carry and move around simply because of the tackle inside. It's very inconvenient to have to walk across a river just to change a fly. Flies can move around and get unorganized easily in some tackle boxes as well. So for the next slides, we'll be talking about the research that we did for our project and the justification. For a justification, we said the storage of tackle is one of the biggest challenges for fishermen around the world. It's very easy for it to become unorganized. And it's something that in fly fishing, you need to make sure everything's organized to make sure the flies are correct for the day. And it's valuable time is lost when a fly fisherman loses a lure or his line breaks on like a tree, which is very easily for anyone to do. And fishermen oftentimes have to walk distances to be, uh, back to their tackle box after losing a lure, since you have to find spots where the, where the trout are, which could be very hard, so you have to move around a lot. And if you have like a 40 pound tackle box, that's gonna make that very unenjoyable. So for our first existing solution, we actually researched the spider wire wolf tackle box. Um, the spider wire wolf tackle box, it's, it's a bag form. You can put it over your shoulder. Um, and the pros of it are, it has a very good amount of tackle storage. Um, you can put pretty much any lure you want inside of there. Um, it's waterproof for the most part. There were a couple spots in it that would allow water to leak in. But for the most part, it pretty much kept the water out. It was also very durable and very mobile. You could walk around with it over your shoulder and it wouldn't be too much of a stress on your shoulder. And some of the cons for it were the tackle sometimes became very unorganized. Um, as with almost any tackle box, you know, you carry it around and a lot of times it shakes around and stuff and the tackle will move around inside. And the body of the bag was not totally waterproof as it allowed a little bit of water to come in. All right, and this is the uh, Berkeley Sportsman fishing cart. As you can see, it's more of like a suitcase looking, th looking tackle box. And the pros of it is that it carries a large amount of storage. It's also extremely easy to transport since it has wheels on it where you can move it like that way. It includes four rod holders, as you can see right here. And that makes it easier for other people who don't have to carry rods when moving. It's also extremely durable fabric, which like you always need that for a tackle box. And it also has great storage for small items like your phone, wallet, earbuds, etc. But the cons is that it's somewhat heavy, so it's, and it also takes up a lot of space in the vehicle. So a lot of people that fly fish not too many times a year have to travel around and go to maybe move to different states and pack a lot of like clothes and other stuff. So this could be a problem if you don't have enough space in your car. It also uh, struggles on steep incliner steps and uh, fly fishing is in the mountains, so that'd be uh, one of the biggest problems and cost is somewhat high, so it wouldn't be a budget item. So for comparing the existing solutions, uh, the spider, spider wire wolf tackle box was more of a bag style, you could put it over your shoulder. Uh, it could become heavy if a lot of tackle was put inside of it. Um, both were waterproof, which is very important when creating a tackle box. And for the Berkeley Sportsman rolling cart, it was a rolling bag style. Um, it had great maneuverability, 
and you, you could move it around very well. You could go a lot of places with it, but it was also very big, and um, it also held a very good amount of tackle. For our science and engineering uh, concept, we thought of material science and hydrology, and we'll talk about them on the next slides. So for our science and engineering concepts, um, the material science was very important for our project, just because we needed to research a lot of materials that would be waterproof and durable for our arm sleeve. Um, when you're fly fishing or fishing in general, uh, a lot of water could get on the arm sleeve very easily, and if you don't have a waterproof material, it could just ruin the arm sleeve. Um, we also just needed a very durable material, just because we don't want it to rip. Uh, there's a lot of trees that could get snagged on a tree or something like that. Um, we also didn't want hooks to get caught in the sleeve, and we wanted it to be able to uh, get like a hook caught in it and maybe just pull it out very easily. And we also researched hydrology, um, just because we needed to see the effect that water had on different types of materials. From this slide on, we'll be talking about our prototype. So some of our design constraints that we had, it needed to be light and mobile. Um, we did not want it to be a heavy thing that you were carrying around while fishing. We wanted it to feel like you almost didn't have it on. Um, it needed to be waterproof. Um, we needed to have a $50 budget, and we needed to have it complete by the capstone deadline, which was May 11th. And some of our design specifications, we needed it to be flexible. Um, we know there's a lot of different sizes of arms, so we wanted it to be kind of a one-size-fits-all type thing. Uh, it needed to be lightweight, so it wasn't a stress or a burden on someone's arm. We needed it to be durable, and we wanted anyone to be able to wear it. And we also needed it to be sweatproof. All right, as you can see here, these are some of our CAD drawings. These more illustrate the, the shape of our arm sleeves and how uh, we came up with it. So here's some more pictures of our CAD drawings. Um, this was something that me and Jackson were not very good at coming into the project, but uh, through practice and making this prototype, we actually got really good at it. And so as you can see, we had a lot more uh, like tackle storage in mind, but we ended up just kind of slimming it down just so it would be a little bit lighter. And for our cost analysis, you can see the gray arm sleeve, which I'll present right here. This was $15.99, but it, all, it came with four different uh, arm sleeves. And the reason why we didn't use that material just because it's a lot more thicker and not able to really still build up a lot of sweat in it. And then uh, for a black arm sleeve, which y'all have is a, uh, yeah. Thank you. This came with just uh, two of the arm sleeves, but as you can see, it's a much better material, especially for fishing, because so when the sun's out, you want to be able to sweat in it, and it's flexible, and this could only really carry one size. And then uh, our tackle box, which was right here, two by four inch, this was only uh, $6.99, and the hooks and magnets, the hooks was $3.99, that's ballparking it, and the magnets were 50 cents, and both of those were provided by Mr. Walker. So for our initial construction of the prototype, originally we were going to use that material right there, the gray sleeve, but we realized there were a lot of problems with it. Just with the waterproof material, it wasn't very waterproof, and it would cause the arm sleeve to stink after a while, so we ended up going to with the more sweatproof, waterproof material of the black sleeve. And we also found a lot of problems with hooks and stuff in that gray sleeve. The hooks would get caught very easily, and it would be very hard to get the hooks out. And we were also going to use um, sort of a fabric to cover the magnets as well, but there was also a hook problem with that fabric that we were using. The hooks would get caught in it very easily, and it was very tough to get them out. So we ended up going to a different material um, that was a lot easier and would allow the hooks to sit on the material but not get caught in it. All right, as you can see, these are some pictures of what we used. We used a different material right here, that blue fabric, which is, uh, was, we saw it came with many problems because it also, the magnets weren't as strong with it as it was with the uh, leather material that we used on the black sleeve. And we used uh, pieces of foam also, which were, we soon like knew that that was already invented, so we couldn't really do that. And it, there was no point of it since we already had magnets to carry our flies. 
but we did keep the same concept of putting a Velcro piece right there and having a tackle box on the end. So this was the second version of our prototype. As you can see, uh, we kind of changed it a little bit. We added the clear tackle box that had six spaces that would allow you to put pretty much anything you wanted in there. And we also added the patch and took away the blue fabric that we were using. And it would allow the hooks to sit on the patch very easily and not get caught. And then this is our last version of our prototype, which is our final. And then uh, all we really changed here from the second was uh, just the uh, arm sleeve material, just because we, like we said before, it's better result, it's better for everything in fly fishing, sweat proof. And so for the next part, we will be talking about our testing of our prototype. And now uh, for this, we did a waterproof test. And uh, after dunking the sleeve into the water, we could conclude that the sleeve does do a solid job of concealing the effects of water. The, uh, the sleeve was fully submerged three times. We were concerned about the condition of the magnets, but they turned out to come out still in great condition. The, middle ta the mini tackle box also came out in great condition and did not allow any water to get inside the box, which ensured that the tackle will be kept safe. Uh, this was the part two of our waterproof test. Uh, for the first waterproof test, we actually just used tap water from our houses. And for this waterproof test, we wanted to use pond water, which has a lot more bacteria in it and would be a lot more realistic for what we would use with the sleeve. Um, so from our second waterproof test, uh, we concluded that some water would cause different effects on our sleeve. And we submerged the sleeve three times again and after doing that, we realized that the bacterial pond water was a lot different. It would cause the sleeve to stink, and it would, it would cause it to dry off a little bit differently. And then this is our second test, the movement test. And for this, uh, from our, so what we did was we put on the arm sleeve and we used a fly fishing rod to see uh, if it would withstand uh, the movement of using a sleeve or if anything would fall off. And from our movement test, we could conclude that all of our parts are intact and attached securely to the arm sleeve. Through multiple test runs, all the parts stayed intact, other than one time where the mini tackle box opened. And test three was our drop test. Um, we wanted to test the durability of our sleeve just to make sure that the tackle box wouldn't fall off the mini tackle box with six spots in it. And we also just wanted to make sure that the lures that were connected with the magnets didn't fall off. And from the drop test, we concluded that it was very durable um, and it only had a problem once where a fly fell off and that was where we dropped her from six feet high and sideways. And then these are some pictures when we dropped it from one foot and three feet and six feet. Um, problems we encountered along the way. The material of the arm sleeve was one of our biggest problems when we first started. Uh, the first material we used was that gray sleeve and we tested it with water we tested it with many different things and the gray sleeve just wasn't very good with water and it was also not very good with hooks the hooks would get caught in it very easily and the initial hot glue was also a very big problem for us the glue would eventually leak through the sleeve and it would get caught and stick to other things and we eventually had to put some cardboard in between the sleeve to kind of um, stop the hot glue from leaking through it. And sewing was also, uh, it was very interesting for us because neither one of us had ever sewed. And we, Mr. Walker taught us sewing and we were not very good at it at first, but eventually we became pretty good at it. All right, and from this slide on, we'll be talking about conclusion and analysis. What would we have changed with our project? Um, we would have definitely shortened the initial brainstorming process. Um, our initial brainstorming process was very long. Um, we were initially actually going to do a tackle box, but through some brainstorming, we realized that was just a little bit too simplistic, and there were already a bunch of tackle boxes we kind of wanted to be different. And we also, we wish we would have shortened the prototyping process. We, sh we spent a lot of time with that gray sleeve, and it had a lot of problems, and we kind of wish we would have went to a different material sooner. And we also wish we would have made a multiple arm sleeve size, such as like a kid size, since we think kids could definitely benefit from the sleeve. And we also wish we could make the design more sleek. 
Uh, the design is a little bit simplistic. We kind of would like to add some style to it and make it more of a appealing product. Uh, and what we learned in Capstone, uh, we both learned how to cast. If we both weren't too good at all at CAD, kind of forgot about it a little bit. And then obviously we learned how to sew. None of us sewed before. And then uh, we learned how to problem solve. Like initially, like we said, we never could not like make a decision of if we want to use the gray arm sleeve or black arm sleeve. We couldn't make a decision if we could uh, want to make a capstone or do something more, in or not capstone, a uh, tackle box to do something more innovative like the uh, arm sleeve. And then uh, we also had to re do a pattern research and then also learn how to do survey making, which would make us more like heads up of who our audience would be going to. And then uh, we learned the most about the engineering process as we had to go through a a lot of brainstorming problems solving to make our product. All right, we would like to give a huge thanks to both Mr. Walker and Mr. Sutter. Uh, Mr. Walker was, is obviously our capstone teacher, and we could not have done this project without Mr. Walker and Mr. Sutter. Um, Mr. Walker just, he helped us a lot with through the brainstorming process and everything, um, just giving us tips, uh, helping us out with materials, and Mr. Sutter also helped us a lot with our brainstorming process. He, uh, when we were initially doing a tackle box, he wanted us to really just go out of the box and make something that was um, a little less simplistic and had a lot of already had a little, had a lot of other products already. And so we would also like to thank our testers and the experts that helped us a lot along the way. And you have any questions? Take it with you just to carry tackle out to the river? Um, so, the arm sleeve is really, uh, it's mainly for just being out on the river. You can bring a couple items with you. Uh, it's not really meant for something to hold all your tackle. But it's also something like the main thing of it, like, yes, you put it on like when you're by the river, but also, like, what it's designed to is like when you want to move around a river, which could be like you could move half a mile and not even know it. That's what it's best for, since you can move around with it instead of like and leave all your tackle maybe at your car. I have a follow-up question: uh, Do you wear it on your throwing arm, or opposite your throwing arm, or could you wear it on both? Uh, I like I would advise to wear it on your non-throwing arm, just because all the tackle would like it may pop up open like it did one time when he was doing it, but yeah, it's designed to make it go on your opposite arm. That was going to be my question. Can you tell us a little more about the movement test? What movements did you do? Did you try both arms? Yeah, so we actually did both arms. Um, we did one on my throwing arm, which I'm a righty. Okay. So I kind of put it on my arm and I used a fishing pole and I just cast it out um, nine or ten times. And there was only one time where the the box actually opened up. So it proved to be pretty good. Is this just fly fishing or where are you fishing as well? It could be used for any type of fishing. Um, it's mainly for fly fishing just because you are walking around in the river. Um, you're kind of you know submerged in the water. So it'd be a lot easier, you know, if you lose a lure you can just grab it off your arm and not have to get out of the river and walk back to your box. So it's mainly for fly fishing but it could be for either one. Yes, yes that was for the waterproof test and they proved to be they proved to be really good um, with that material over top of it I'm not sure what material it is um, but it proved to be pretty good and the magnets they didn't take any damage from the water well, where did you get the material then uh, we got it from you <laughs> Regarding the waterproof test, uh, you mentioned it several times, waterproof, so it, does it absorb no water? Or what is the waterproof test and what's the criteria? Well, yeah, I mean, it does absorb water, but like over like time, that's when it like, it'll, it dries out very easily. And like, except like with that one, that one becomes soggy and smelly. Like this one, we noticed like, we dipped it in the water, wore it, and like wore it for like 10, 15 minutes in the sun, like, and sweating it obviously, and it didn't really smell at all. And it's easily washable too, and, and it's just a lot more useful. But yeah, I'd say it's, like it, it does absorb some water, but it dries out very easily. How would you recommend washing it? By hand or a washing machine? Like a washing machine. 
I would, I would maybe say that it would be better to just wash it with soap, just because magnets are tough in a washing machine. They might, you know, they might stick to something. So I, I would say that soap and water are probably the best bet for washing. Have you brought it out in the river yet? We, we tried it in a pond. We have not tried it in a river. But we did take it out on a pond, and it worked pretty well. back to your uh, problem statement. Okay. So it is specifically for fly fishing. Because you're yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, you're done. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see y'all tomorrow or Friday, right? Tomorrow. Still got assignments to do. Yes, sir.